placed him in the center of baseball's most controversial issues. If you ask me what I did, I just told you what I did. Now, am I a steroid user? I don't consider that as being a steroid user. Steroids, race, and the state of the game. Real Sports sits down with the Detroit Tigers' Gary Sheffield. The Emmy Award winning Real Sports with Brian Gumbo premieres Tuesday night at 10. Nothing is out of bounds. Hopkins. What a performance by Hopkins. Right. Now Winky Wright makes his statement. The countdown begins. What a fight! It's the latest chapter in the series that takes you beyond the ropes and behind the scenes. You guys are the first guys we let in here. We bring you the whole story from the training camps to the show before the show with in-depth analysis and exclusive access to the current and future legends of the sport. From the top, Joel. You want to talk your trash? We'll see. Step inside as former undisputed middleweight champion Bernard Hopkins challenges one of the sport's pound-for-pound -pound best, the relentless Winky Wright. Two world-class champs on a collision course. Countdown to Hopkins Wright. Tonight at midnight. And now, HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing. Welterweight extravaganza. Three fights, two locations, 247 pound title belts on the line. Arturo Gatti is 35. For 16 years, he has treated boxing fans to one of sports' most compelling high wire acts. Can you believe Arturo Gatti? Oh, what a drama! A boxing everyman who's captured the public's imagination with his courage. Look at Arturo firing that broken right hand. And his resiliency. Arturo Gatti refusing to go down as Mickey Ward pounds away. Tonight, boxing's drama king will need all that legendary resolve as he enters the ring having been knocked out in two of his last three fights. Another big shot, and this time Arturo Gatti is ruined. Can Gatti rise again versus Alfonso Gomez? Or is it finally time to cede the stage to the next generation? 147-pound titleist Antonio Margarito and undefeated challenger Paul Williams both hope to become stars for the present and the future. Both are among the division's elite. Both claim to be the most avoided man in the sport. Each has the opportunity for a star-making performance at the other's expense. Also looking to raise his profile tonight, power hitter Kermit Cintron, who puts his slice of the 147-pound title up for grabs against fellow knockout artist, Walter Matisse. First up, from Atlantic City, it's Cintron and Matisse, followed by Arturo Gatti versus Alfonso Gomez. Then on to California for Margarito Williams. It's a coast-to-coast -coast welterweight triple header on World Championship Boxing. of World Championship Boxing. Tonight we have a coast-to-coast -coast triple header in the welterweight division, starting here in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Kermit Sintra defends his title against Walter Matisse. Next up, Arturo Gatti returns after a one-year layoff to face Alfonso Gomez. Then we'll send you to Carson, California, as Antonio Margarito puts his title on the line against Paul Williams in our main event. Welcome to the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey. I'm Bob Papa. So glad you can join us for this action-packed welterweight triple header. It's a great night of boxing for you here on HBO's World Championship Boxing. And welcome in HBO boxing analyst Max Kellerman. And Max, when you take a look at this triple header and the names that are involved in these three fights, it's action, 
action and more action. Yeah, and Arturo Gatti's been boxing's action hero over the last decade or more even by now, kind of like uh, Bruce Willis in Die Hard. And in fact, I went to see Die Hard for this last week, middle of the week, late show, place was packed. And you look around here, this place is going to be nearly packed, and everyone's out here to see Arturo Gatti. But you know, Bob, what I was thinking about by the end of Die Hard 4 was, when's the next Jason Bourne movie going to be out? When's the Bourne, I think they're calling it the Bourne Ultimatum, going to be out? And the question I have tonight, because Arturo Gatti's the second fight in a triple header th with all action fighters and what promised to be all action fights, the question is, as Jim mentioned, will Gatti be upstaged? Is he still relevant, or is the Arturo Gatti franchise finally at an end? Well, we're going to find out tonight, and it's going to be very intriguing as this boardwalk call continues to fill out. Well, Antonio Margarito and Paul Williams will be squaring off in Carson, California. We send it out to the Home Depot Center, and welcome in Jim Lampley. All right, thank you very much, Bob Papa. We expect great excitement here where everything figures for a terrific matchup between rising potential contender, unbeaten Paul Williams, and the man whom everybody seems to have wanted to avoid in the welterweight division these past few years, Antonio Margarito, working with me as always here on the West Coast, HBO boxing analyst Larry Merchant. Larry, a welter of welterweights in action both here and in Atlantic City. What does it all mean to the division? Well, it not only means something to the division, but it means something to boxing because the biggest fights in boxing today probably can be made in the welterweight division. We know that Floyd Mayweather, despite saying that he is retired, just means waiting for the next opponent. There's been discussions about Ricky Hatton. Maybe, maybe not. Shane Mosley is the odd man in because he might wind up fighting Mayweather or possibly Cotto if Margarito loses tonight. Margarito has a deal in place to face Cotto if he wins. If Williams wins, if Cintron wins, maybe they'll unify their titles. Big stuff in the welterweight division. There's something else in the big picture, and that's the big picture you're looking at. We have six fighters who don't know how to play solitaire in the ring. These guys, Jim, are Texas Hold'em guys who push all their chips into the table. Yeah, in the words of promoter Bob Arum, no businessmen tonight, just fighters. So it should be tremendous action here. We expect that you're going to see the same thing there on the East Coast. Let's get the fight started as we go back to Bob Papa. All right, Jim, at the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey, we'll check in in Carson, California throughout the course of the evening. We are set for our first bout of the evening. Welterweight showdown, Kermit Cintron taking on Walter Matisse. Interestingly enough, talking about Margarito and Williams in our Carson, California fight is the fact that the only loss on the resume of Cintron came to Margarito two years ago. The only loss on Matisse's ledger came last year to Paul Williams. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape for Cintron and Matisse as we take a look at the key vitals for the fighters. Matisse weighted at one pound more on our unofficial scales. Matisse 153 pounds and Cintron 152. Time for the rules with our unofficial ringside scorer Harold Letterman. The Kermit Cintron what the Matisse fight is scheduled for 12 rounds using the rules of the, uh, the, the Association of Boxing Commissions. They're Real, real quick, there's no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight. In case it comes caused by an accidental headbutt, we go to the scorecards if the four rounds have been completed and you cannot be saved by the bell in any round, including the 12th and final round. Bob! Walter Matisse getting ready to make his way into the ring. He hails from Argentina. He last fought on October the 20th. He's from a town, Trilu, Argentina, where they will have a television monitor in the center of the town, Max, to watch him fight. He's that popular an athlete. Well, according to Matisse and his people, 25 of his first 26 professional fights were nationally televised in Argentina. That, coupled with the fact that he really is an all-action fighter, a go-for-broke fighter in the ring, winging that 
big left hook. I mean, Matisse hits you with the left hook, there's going to be trouble. Comes from a fighting family. His father was a professional fighter. His mother was a professional fighter. His brother is a pro. His sister's a pro. And his wife, Shanina, is also a pro with a 2-0 record in the flyweight division. Yeah, don't get in any scuffles with them at the family barbecue. And another thing about Matisse is he was oblivious, Max, to what his purse was for this fight. All he wants is a belt. Yeah, and he's making twenty, thirty thousand dollars. He said, I don't know if it's twenty or thirty thousand dollars. He says because where he's from, his local government gives him a stipend to train because he is a popular athlete and there's generates pride in the area and brings attention to the area. He has corporate sponsors to take care of various other expenses and twenty, thirty thousand dollars in Argentina goes a long way. And when we asked him about his investment strategy and if he had any advisors, he said, "My wife, always a good thing." to keep your wife informed on the investments. <laughs> yeah, that makes him no different than everybody else in the world, right? So Walter Batiste has made his way into the ring. He's a guy that likes to jump on his opponents. Most of his fights have been in Argentina. He's one and one fighting in the United States of America. Now Kermit Cintron makes his ring walk. Born in Puerto Rico in 1987 at the age of eight after his mother passed away from cancer. He moved in with an uncle and aunt in Reading, Pennsylvania. His father passed away in 1992. An extraordinary high school wrestler who received a college scholarship for wrestling. Thought he might become a professional baseball player someday. His career moved along until the loss to Margarito. He's hooked up with Emmanuel Stewart, and it's like a rebirth in his career. You know, if you see uh, Patriots head coach Bill Belichick sign a guy, or, or uh, Oakland Athletics man uh, general manager Billy Bean sign a guy, you think to yourself, huh, you start to look at that player a little differently because they make consistently such good moves. They have such a good eye for talent. And Emmanuel Stewart is that way in boxing. A colleague of ours, yes, of course, but it really is the truth. He has such a good eye for talent and consistently works with guys who wind up with very good and lasting careers that when you see Emmanuel Stewart work with a guy, take an interest in his career, you think, you look at that guy differently. You look at his future differently, and I think that's what's going on with Kermit Cintron right now. And one of the keys is the fact that his athleticism has served him in a very limited amateur boxing resume. We are set for Cintron and Matisse. Time for the formal introductions with our ring announcer, Michael Buffer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to Atlantic City, New Jersey's Boardwalk Hall. Where tonight, by way of Caesars Atlantic City, main events is proud to present an evening of world-class professional boxing on HBO for your entertainment. Sponsored by Nemiroff, all bouts sanctioned by the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board, Boxing Commissioner Larry Hazard Sr. At ringside, the three judges scoring this bout on the 10-point system, Joe Garcia, Lawrence Layton and Joe Pasquale and inside the ring your referee in charge of the action Earl Morton and now ladies and gentlemen let's get this party started 12 rounds of boxing for the IBF welterweight championship of the world introducing first fighting out of the blue corner Wearing red with black, official weight, 147 pounds. His professional record, 26 victories, including 25 knockouts with only one to beat. From Trello, Chubut, Argentina, the challenger, Thomas y Caballeros, El Terrible, Matisse. And his opponent across the ring, fighting out of the red corner, wearing gold official weight, 146 pounds. His professional record, 27 victories, including 25 knockouts. But only one from Reading, Pennsylvania. Boricuas, the reigning, defending, IBF welterweight, champion of the world, Kermit, the killer, Let's 
Citra, Matt. Hey, hey, mouthpiece. You got to do a better job. You got to fucking trip the same Okay, you got that mouthpiece in there. Okay, y'all both received the same instruction. I expect you to protect yourself at all times and give me a good, clean break. Touch gloves and good luck. Matisse has just about as big a left hook as you'll see in boxing. Same goes for Cintron with the right bucket. hand. Don't blink. Get that out. Get that and there's Emmanuel Stewart, there. our colleague. We'll check in with Get him the throughout the course of this fight. Then he'll join us ringside for Gaddy Gomez. And also he will provide commentary Man. on Margarito Williams on this welterweight triple header. We get things started here in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and we are underway with round number one. Seven first round knockouts for Cintron in his career. Six for Matisse. One of the interesting aspects concerning Cintron when we talk with him is the fact that the hand problems that he's had over the years he feels are no longer a problem. We'll find out. Matisse says his game plan is to jump on Cintron and keep throwing punches because he believes that Cintron can't integrate his defense with his offense. That is, when he's being attacked, he goes into a defensive shell. We'll see. I seem to remember David Estrada, among others, taking that approach against Cintron and winding up knocked out. Good stiff one-two from Cintron. Tise is coming off the longest layoff of his career, having not fought since last October. He's added a physical trainer to help his conditioning, which he feels will make him strong as this fight goes on. Because these guys are not the headliners tonight, there's not real electricity here at the moment. They're going to have to create the electricity with the action in the ring. And I anticipate that's what will indeed happen as this fight goes on. Trying to work that jab. Swinging left hook, left hand to the belly by Cintron. And then he moves away. Good right hand by Cintron. Got through the defense of Matisse. So far from the reaction of the crowd, you wouldn't know, but it's been a good action fight. Matisse is doing what he said he'd do. He's throwing punches and pressing the action. And Cintron is trying to catch and counter, as many Emmanuel Stewart fighters are trained to do. You see Cintron blocking the hook with his right hand and countering with his own left hand. Catching and countering. Lunging there from Matisse, which could be dangerous. Right hand Big by right Cintron. Hand by Hurt Matisse. Matisse's never been knocked down. He's a right hand and he goes down for the first time in his career. Earl Morton with the count. And there's the bell to end round one. So much for that part of his resume. But the electricity is now starting to build as a result of the action these guys are creating in the ring. You're okay. Hey, hey, Miami. Come in. Look at me. Are you okay? Yeah. Breathe. Somebody wants me. Breathe one. The right uppercut that started it hit him right, hit Cintron, it hit Matisse right on the butt. In fact, I think there was a straight right hand that preceded that uppercut. That was the, the punch that got it on its way. But Cintron is a devastating one punch knockout guy. He can start you, if not finish you, with one right hand. And a right hand to the chin, as you pointed out, Max, was the thing that got Matisse reeling as we began round number two. Right hand sends Matisse down again. 
his legs are, are, are shot. Matisse knows where he, where he is, but his legs are not cooperating with the commands his brain is sending right now. And the quicker hands of Cintron. Oh, and a left right combination, and Matisse's down, and it's over. In round number two. The accuracy of Kermit Cintron was the difference. Matisse is a devastating left hooking puncher, but could not land that shot against the much more accurate and finely skilled Kermit Cintron. What a knockout. Okay. He'd be all right. He's a mouthpiece. He'd be all right. He's all right. Cintron Doctor. closed the show in fantastic fashion as the ringside physicians attend to Matisse. They'll get him up in stages. Make sure he's okay. Then they'll get a stool for him to sit up on before they stand him up. Devastating performance by Kermit Cintron as he blasts Walter Matisse. The quicker hands of Cintron, the more accurate punches, and he dismantles Matisse, dropping at the end of round one and then twice here in round two. In a way that. Oh. And this is from a devastating puncher. Not only is it flush, but Cintron can hurt you even if he doesn't catch a flush. In a way, Kermit Cintron has almost done himself a disservice here because the action never really, really built to a crowd exciting crescendo because it was such a one sided fight ultimately and he was out after the left hand the right hand was there for the crowd's pleasure and Kermit Cintron keeps his belt he says his career has started over he said I was most known for the loss to Margarito and even he considers himself at the bottom of the pecking order when it comes to the welterweight division as far as champions but he has a defining moment here against Walter Matisse official time of the stoppage let's check in with our ring announcer Michael Buffer ladies and gentlemen the end comes at 29 seconds of round number two the winner by KO victory still IBF welterweight champion of the world Permit the killer Sintro. So Kermit Sintron with a devastating knockout of Walter Matisse. He dropped him near the end of round number one and then knocks him down twice in round number two. We take a look at the final numbers for Sintron and Matisse as you look at the total punches. 39% is the number. In round number one, Cintron threw 86 of those 97. And he dismantled Matisse. And the power punches, well, Cintron closed the show in round number two. He was seven for seven with the power shots in that second round as he dismantles Matisse. As this one gets stopped in the second, Matisse took punishment from Kermit Cintron, who gets his 28th win and his 26th stoppage. He's with Max Kellerman in the ring. Congratulations, Kermit, on a devastating uh, knockout win. What statement do you make with this fight? Hey, I'm going to let everybody, everybody know that, you know, Kermit Cintron's back, man. That fight with Margarito, that was nothing. This is it. This is the real Kermit Cintron. Did, the, did this fight finally, do you think, did this fight finally, do you think, redeem you for the loss to Margarito? I think the fight did it. Uh, exactly. I think the fight did it, you know. I think that uh, the fight with Margarito, it should be erased. You know, uh, I came here and uh, worked, trained hard, and it showed the results, you know. It showed. What specifically did you work on with Emmanuel Stewart that you brought to this fight today? Boxing him. Boxing. That's Emmanuel style. Boxing. I'm a big puncher, so... You know, he's, he's, he's getting me as a, a complete fighter now. I and mean, I'm still, I still got a lot of uh, work to do, but he's, I'm going to get there. Okay, you have a belt. You're coming off a career best win in terms of the national audience that saw it and the impressive way in which you finished the fight. Who do you want next? I want Shea Mosley next. I think, you know, that's the best opponent for me uh, right after this fight. Uh, Shea Mosley, he wants uh, to fight a uh, champion. I'm a champion. Come and get it. Congratulations, Kermit. Bob? 
Well, Kermit Cintron, spectacular as we take a look at some upcoming bouts on our HBO boxing calendar next Saturday night on pay-per-view. Bernard Hopkins and Winky Wright, two of boxing's most skilled fighters, meet in a 170-pound battle. Then on July 28th on Boxing After Dark, Vernon Forrest and Carlos Baldemir meet in a matchup of former welterweight champions. On August the 4th on pay-per-view, Eric Morales in his first fight since losing the rubber match to Manny Pacquiao last November takes on David Diaz. And finally, on August 11th on Boxing After Dark, it's a doubleheader. Daniel Ponce de Leon defends his 122-pound title against Ray Batista, and 118-pound title holder Johnny Gonzalez faces Jerry Penalosa. For all that and more, log on to HBO.com. We're at the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey, for our welterweight triple header. Still to come, Arturo Gatti and Alfonso Gomez. Here in Atlantic City, New Jersey, a 10-round welterweight showdown. Then we'll send you to Carson, California, as Antonio Margarito puts his title on the line against Paul Williams in a 12-round welterweight showdown. Well, what a performance by Kermit Cintron here in Atlantic City, New Jersey. As we welcome you back inside Boardwalk Hall, it continues to fill up in anticipation of Arturo Gatti. And Max, for those who are arriving late, they missed a blistering performance. We expected action, action, action. It was one-sided action. Yeah, it was almost, in a way, disappointing. Hard to say a, a, a sensational second-round knockout is disappointing. But Matisse has proven in his career to be a resilient guy, a tough guy, not only a big left hooker. Paul Williams fighting in uh, the ostensible main event tonight against Antonio Margarito. It took him 10 rounds, averaging about 100 punches a round, to finally stop Matisse, not knock him off his feet. Cintron just obliterated him. Emmanuel Stewart, you could see the, his, the cronk style, the catch and counter style that Stewart's been working. Uh, on with Kermit Cintron, the way Stewart trains many of his fighters, really paid dividends. Well, you know, it's interesting because when we talked with Cintron, he, he was a fighter that was moved along out of Reading, Pennsylvania, did not have the kind of gym experience that he needed. He was moved along by his uncle, but he was only taken to a certain point. He feels that his career is really starting over. He's gone to the Kronk gym. He's getting the best sparring he's ever gotten. He's getting the best training he's ever gotten. It's almost as if a fighter is starting o over now at 28 and 1 with 26 knockouts. Yeah, the culture of the Kronk is so competitive. Uh, Kermit told us a couple days ago that when he first got there, I believe it was Andy Lee, Emmanuel Stewart's middleweight, says fresh meat. And he didn't know how to take it at first, but when you walk in that gym, you have to prove yourself. Another thing about Emmanuel Stewart that I'll say, and I've said it in the past, I would liken to having him as your trainer, like having another football uh, analogy, but like having an offensive coordinator as the head coach. He likes his fighters to take chances and be crowd-pleasing, even as they box defensively responsibly. And that's the, kind, the best kind of fighter to watch, a top-notch, world-class, skilled fighter who also not, even if he's not pressing the fight, makes good action fights and takes takes risks. That's Kermit Cintron boxing, but by no stretch of the imagination, not crowd pleasing. That was quite crowd pleasing. Let's take a look back at how Kermit Cintron dismantled Walter Matisse in this fight. He dropped him near the end of round number one, and Max, we saw Matisse kind of reaching a little bit lazy with his punches, and Cintron was quicker and sharper with his punches. Right. I mean, Cintron was. Laser accurate with the right hand, not only the straight right hand, but the uppercut, and both punches he throws with incredible force. He's really among the very best pure punchers in boxing. And uh, as he refines his boxing skill, it, may, it makes him that much more dangerous. Matisse is no less a puncher than Cintron. If Matisse catches him with a left hook, it's going to do the same damage that Cintron's right hand does, but he can't catch it because he doesn't have the skills to do it. And his daughter had a chance to see Dad come up with a tremendous victory. Well, still to come here in Atlantic City, New Jersey, of course, Arturo Gatti returns to the ring after almost a one-year layoff. He'll be taking on Alfonso Gomez of contender fame. Gomez feels that he has the goods to press Gatti. Gatti, at 35 years of age, says he's rejuvenated, he's refreshed. Earlier this evening, as Arturo made his way into Boardwalk Hall here in Atlantic City, where he'll be fighting for the eighth consecutive time, Max had a chance to talk with Thunder Gatti. Arturo, you're in with a younger, bigger guy tonight. How are you going to beat this kid? 
Well, I prepared myself very well in training camp. Uh, mentally ready, experience, uh, power, and uh, I'm going to use my legs a lot tonight. How does this fight compare to other big fights in your career, considering two of your last three fights where you are in your career? How does it compare to the big fights you've had? Uh, just, uh, you know, Gomez is a young fighter. He's coming here to make a name for himself. For me, this is just as big as the other fights I've had before. So it's an important fight. Uh, I want to keep my name and my title over here in Atlantic City, New Jersey. I want to fight for bigger fights after this one. And uh, I know Gomez is coming to win this fight tonight. Your fans come out and support you, win, lose, or draw. Is this a must-win fight? Uh, definitely is for me, for my fans, for my team, and uh, it's just to prove the whole world and HBO also, you know, to show that I still have it and I still have a couple more fights in me. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you very much, and uh, you guys won't regret this. Thanks. I'm pretty relaxed, Arturo Gatti. We had a chance to visit with him yesterday, and he was in a playful mood yesterday. Very relaxed. He kept talking about his legs. Everyone said uh, he's shot, he doesn't have anything less, and he kept pointing to his legs as the key here tonight. Well, and I think that's related to the, to the reason why he's in a playful mood, because Mickey Ward in training camp got the guy in shape, made sure he came in in shape, didn't have to kill himself to make weight. You meet with a fighter who's drying out to make weight, and, can, and you've met... Uh, Gotti has been so dried out before some fights he can barely move his tongue to talk and uh, that guy is going to be a little more ornery than a guy who's made weight much more comfortably and that's the same reason why he anticipates he'll have his legs throughout the fight tonight and you talk about the weight I mean he says he's been on weight for almost two weeks in fact after we met with him yesterday he said let's go eat meanwhile Alfonso Gomez would like to feed off the recognition of Arturo Gatti feed off his fame and sort of take his spotlight away. Of course, he starred in the series The Contender, very popular in that series. But this is a big setting for him, the biggest stage of his career, fighting someone of Arturo Gatti's pedigree. Earlier, Max had a chance to talk with Alfonso Gomez. Alfonso, you look very relaxed for a guy who's about to have the biggest fight of his life. What are you thinking about right now? Um, well, I'm thinking that I've prepared very hard for this fight. Uh, I've been waiting for this moment for a long, long time. So, you know, the, the preparation that I had in the gym gives me the confidence to be relaxed right now because I know, I know I'm going to go in there uh, and just do my thing. And what is that thing going to be? How do you plan on fighting Arturo Gatti? Uh, pressuring him if he decides to box me and counterpunching if uh, he decides to brawl with me. You're a popular TV fighter and a likable guy, but you're in Gotti's backyard, and he's the action hero of this generation. What kind of reception do you anticipate the crowd will give you tonight? Well, you know, I think uh, uh, people have seen me in The Contender, and, uh, and without The Contender, they see me on ESPN fights, and they see me all over the place, and they see that uh, I'm, a, I'm a guy who doesn't talk crap all the time. I'm a guy who behaves himself, have a family values, and I think that's gonna, uh, the crowd gonna, likes that, so I don't think I'm going to get booed. Um, I think I'm going I'm to get a lot of cheers, and I'm waiting for my fans to start cheering me on, and the ones that are not my fans, at the end of the fight, they will be my fans. Thank you, Alfonso, and good luck. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, Max, uh, the contenders right now are 0 for 3 when they've stepped up in big fights. But as Alfonso told us, he's a very soulful young man. And as he told us, he said, I'm not fighting for a contender record. I'm fighting for myself. I'm fighting for my family. In fact, he's engaged to be married, but he won't set a date yet because he says, I won't set a date until I win a world title. Uh, he's a little different as far as his thoughtfulness. Well, he's calm, um, but, you know, he's not fighting Joe Calzaghe tonight who's a, a real tough guy to beat. He's fighting a much more beatable fighter in Arturo Gatti. I mentioned the Die Hard series uh, off the top of the show, that franchise. You know what made the first movie so great was the antagonist, the villain, Hans Gruber. Remember how great he was? He was there right till the end. Cintron, talking about whether Gatti will be upstage tonight, uh, Cintron certainly had a dominant performance but will there be buzz he didn't really have that antagonist who was with him till the end of the show he got him out in the second round and so there wasn't this great back and forth action and Gotti throughout his career when paired not with the top level fighters not with Floyd Mayweather Jr. or Oscar De La Hoya those guys dominate Gotti but with the next level fighters like Ivan Robinson good fighters but not world beaters when Gotti's paired with those guys good enough to stay with Gotti till the end not good enough to dominate him even in even though there are fighters in and around Gotti's era who were more dominant he was the guy on everyone's mind because he had those great action fights and in Gomez 
I believe he has that kind of antagonist, the kind of guy who's going to be there all fight and a, a kind of willing and excellent antagonist to make a great action fight. We'll find out if Alfonso Gomez holds up his end of the bargain tonight in his showdown with Arturo Gatti. Well, the Atlantic City Boardwalk Hall continues to fill up. Still to come here in Atlantic City, the 10-round welterweight showdown between Arturo Thunder Gatti and Alfonso Gomez. Part of our triple header tonight, of course, Antonio Margarito squaring off against Paul Williams in Carson, California. For more on that, we send it out to California and Jim Lampley. Jim? All right, thank you very much, Bob Papa. And while Max is speculating on how much buzz Kermit Cintron can generate with his spectacular second round knockout of Walter Matisse, it's worth pointing out in Cintron's favor that there may conceivably be a predictive element in that performance for what happens here in Carson tonight. Because Matisse last year went 10 very tough rounds with Paul Williams, stretched Williams to the limit in that fight before ultimately Williams was able to knock him out. Matisse looked dangerous in the fight against Paul Williams over the course of 10 rounds. Whereas Margarita annihilated Kerman Cintron two years ago knocking him out in five rounds embarrassing him with the violence of the knockout and for a short period of time there stalling Cintron's career so if you put a lot of stock in what Cintron did to Matisse within the past half hour it might tell you that Antonio Margarito is an even better bet than you might have thought against Paul Williams here tonight of course styles make fights and this result could turn out to be something entirely different we'll see meanwhile appearing on the undercard here tonight the only American to have won a gold medal in Olympic boxing in Athens Andre Ward continuing his off and on rise at 168 pounds and let's bring in Larry Merchant to comment a little bit more on this coming into tonight's fight against an opponent named Francisco Diaz Larry Ward was 12 and 0 with seven knockouts and already had a legion of doubters as to his ultimate value as either a super middleweight 168 pounder or a light heavyweight wherever he ultimately chooses to wind up but tonight and we're going to take a look at it here a great performance. Tonight he looked like a professional fighter tonight he looked like uh, he had graduated finally from from the amateur ranks he fought a strong tough kid uh, who had lost one fight and won around 19 or 20 but more importantly was how he went about his work body punching hard jams flat footed uh, not fighting willy nilly wildly and just hoping to win with athleticism. He was trying to win with professionalism. Well, let's take a look at what Ward did en route to uh, what becomes a third round knockout of Francisco Diaz. Here's uh, a look at the beginning of the fight. Ward over De Diaz's shoulder there. The opponent was stolid, heavy footed, solidly built. Looked as though for a while he might be difficult for Ward, but on that combination in round three, Diaz hit the canvas, and when he got up, he was unable to move forward resolutely. And just a short period of time after that, Larry Merchant went to Antonio Margarito's dressing room to talk to the American-born, now Mexican-living fighter about his fight with Paul Williams tonight. Antonio, you've said that Williams is a harder fight than Cotto, but you've also said it's an easy fight. Explain that. Antonio, tú no has dicho que la pelea de Williams es más dura que, que la de Cotto, pero eh, también dice que la pelea es más fácil. Explícanos. Bueno, este, uh, yo digo no duro, sino difícil por lo, por lo alto y por lo zurdo, y digo que más, más fácil por lo, por lo, de, lo de Cotto, que está un poquito más y se presta más a mi estilo. Yeah, uh, the reason I say uh, Williams is hard to uh, fight because of his style. He's a southpaw and he's tall. Cotto, on the other hand, he's shorter and he's a right-handed. It's that right down my alley. Are you going to have to win this fight as much or more with your will than your skill? ¿Tú crees que vas a tener que ganar esta pelea con más con tu con tu habilidad que que con tu ganas de de ganar? Bueno, solamente con con el corazón y con mi experiencia. I, I'm going to win this fight with my heart, with my experience. So, do you acknowledge that he is the quicker man, and that therefore you have to be the more hurting man? Entonces tú reconoces que él es el hombre más veloz y tú tienes que el, el que va a imponer tu fuerza. Claro que sí, él este pues uh, es es un poco rápido, pero no lo miro con con golpes potentes. Yeah, I, I think he's a, he's a little swifter, but uh, no, nothing with with power. Both of you throw many many punches. 
is this an invitation for you to throw fewer, harder punches? Ustedes dos tiran muchos, muchos golpes, más de 100 eh, pun, eh, por round. ¿Esto indica que tú vas a tirar menos golpes, pero más potente? Exactamente. Quizás a lo mejor un poco de menos golpes que él, porque quizás es más rápido, pero él cachetea más y los míos van a ir más, más duros. Yeah, absolutely. And it might be that he's going to throw more punches, but mine are going to be more potent, harder punches than his. Thank you. Good luck. A few moments later, Larry went to the dressing room of the man who straddles the river across... Uh, Aiken, South Carolina, and Augusta, Georgia. Paul Williams, here's what he had to say. Paul, Margarita, as a veteran, has been asked virtually all the questions that a fighter can be asked in the ring. What are the questions you feel you haven't had to ask yet that you might have to answer tonight? Uh, I, I don't know yet. You know, the questions I'm going to ask, you know what I'm saying, when they ask me how does it feel to be a world champion, you know what I'm saying, I'm it feel good and stuff. And they ask who I want to fight, I'm going to tell I want to fight Cotto or uh, uh, Mayweather. Then the I'm talking about in the ring. For example, your chin. Do you feel it's been adequately tested? Do you feel it will be more tested tonight than it ever has been? It's been tested before with Walter Matisse, but it's not going to get tested tonight like that. Both of you throw lots and lots of punches. Would it be an advantage to be more flat-footed and throw some harder punches than volumes of punches in this kind of fight? It's possibly, but um, I just have to um, figure it out when I get out there in the ring. You know, my game plan will uh, dictate to how I'm going to fight them and stuff then. How do you think going into this fight against a grizzled old vet that a young whippersnapper like yourself is going to be able to handle him. I handled him before, even though that was in sparring. But now this is the real thing. No head gears, no heavy clothes on. Everything is loose. So we got 10-ounce gloves on. So everything will be much faster and stuff. So I, I, I'm pretty sure Margarita, he know what to expect. So he's not going to come out there and get crazy or nothing. I'm just going to have to keep him in check. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Jim? For the last two years, while various big-name fighters in the division, notably both Floyd Mayweather and Shane Mosley, have backed away from offers to fight Antonio Margarito, Paul Williams has set himself apart by constantly calling him out. Larry Merchant, we spoke to both fighters yesterday, and they both seem very confident. You can make an argument that it's the first time for an event of this magnitude for either of the two fighters. Did you sense a mood change between yesterday and today for either of the two? I don't, no, um, because I'm not experienced in talking to Williams, and I don't recall talking to Margarita before a fight. I think that they will fight as well as they can. Their relatively low weights suggest that this is the most important fight they can imagine at this point. It means that they've trained really hard. So um, I can't take anything from that. Um, you do in the ring what your body tells you to do. Um, what you do outside of the ring sometimes is other people telling you what to do or another part of you. It'll be interesting to see which fighter can fight his fight. If both live up to their punch stat profiles, it's yet another candidate in the continuing series of candidates for fight of the year. Let's go back to Bob Papa in Atlantic City. Jim and Larry, thank you very much. We're looking forward to Margarito Williams as we welcome you back inside Boardwalk Hall here in Atlantic City as the crowd continues to file in to see their favorite son for the eighth consecutive time. He'll be taking center stage in this ring, Arturo Gatti. He's squaring off against Alfonso Gomez in a 10-round welterweight showdown. Well, Arturo Gatti is 35 years of age. He hasn't fought in nearly a year. But he feels that he's ready to reinvent himself for yet another time in his career. And as Arturo Gatti gets ready for this fight and tries to reinvent himself and summons up that courage once more to put forth one of those great efforts, he's done it in such a way with a new trick up his sleeve. Not far from the shores of Pompano Beach, Florida, Arturo Gatti begins his morning training session. Good morning, good morning. I feel important today this morning. Thank you, thank you. At 35, Arturo Gatti is at a crossroads, having lost two of his last three fights. And now, without former trainer Buddy McGirt, Gatti has retooled his body and chosen a new person to guide his comeback attempt. I don't know if I would have been in this condition. 
for it to be for him. However, there is something familiar about the red hair and the occasional body punch of Gaddy's new trainer. Yes, Arturo Gatti's trainer is none other than the man who he fought in one of boxing's epic trilogies. At this point in my life, you know, I need somebody to push me. I mean, I think it was a perfect match. It's been five years since Gatti and Ward first matched wills, hearts, and punches in thrilling and brutal fashion. We told you it might be a candidate for fight of the year. We didn't know it would be a candidate for fight of the century. He retired me. When he hit me, my brain shifted and hit the <laughs> back of my head. And I fought my eyes to go on E. Like, uh, my vision was uh, screwed up for a year, you know? Oh, forgive me. Surprisingly, there are no hard feelings here. Instead, their fierce battles bred respect and a friendship formed in post-fight recovery. We saw each other in the hospital. I heard when they brought him in, so I pulled the curtain and I saw him and I started talking to him. And I had so much respect afterwards. He came to my retirement party after that. Now we, we kind of hung out and stuff and exchanged numbers. It's not too many guys that went through what I went through and what he went through. So you have to respect the guy. After their final meeting in 2003, Ward retired to Massachusetts and began quietly training young fighters. This past April, Gaddy's advisors had an idea. Who else can drive Arturo more than, you know, than Mickey, as far as motivation? And Arturo really liked the idea. I called him. I said, yo, Mick, what are you doing? He goes, you want to come to training camp? He was, uh, and he was saying, what do you mean? He goes, you want to train me? I was just, like, kind of shocked, so I'm like, I kind of hesitate a little bit. I was like, yo, you want to come or no? <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's quiet. And it's then cool. from there on, it's been good. Seeing Ward and Gaddy working together seems straight out of a movie. Apollo Creed successfully trained Rocky Balboa, and perhaps this can work too. Ward can counterpunch and remains in peak physical condition. That's why this was such a great idea for Mickey to come into the camp with me, is uh, the way he's been pushing me. I don't need someone to teach me how to fight right now. You know? I'm not going to come in and teach him nothing he don't know. It's just basically give him motivation. Jab right hook, right hook. Jab right here, hook. OK. Nice hook. Everyone's going to think, oh, because I, I was a brawler. He ain't going to tell him to box. He's going to have him bro No. You, you got to fight smart. In, in this game, it's hit, not be hit. Not like, not like me, hit and get hit again. It appears the presence of his old foe has rejuvenated Gaddy's commitment to training. And after a focused morning session, Ward allows his fighter to have some fun at the local racetrack. So who's going to win this race? Yeah, what's, uh, what's up with you guys? Tying us up, two and two. Get the vintage again. It's just fun, and the whole training camp was fun. Everything was good, everything was positive. Well, that was a round that I couldn't come back from. <laughs> Man, that 360, I couldn't come back from it. Ward wins this competition, and a few hours later, he leads Gaddy again, pacing him through an evening training run. Mickey was definitely the guy to be next to me and train with me. Running with a guy that you fought three times, that you respect, <laughs> trust him, makes you run a little harder. As dust turns into darkness, and as Gaddy enters the twilight of his career, he's confident he has chosen the right man to guide him. My best run up to now, huh? Excellent, excellent. Call my best by far, by, uh, when I got here till now, night and day, night and day. It's incredible. Whoever thinks he's done, Believe me, he ain't done. Now yeah, watch. <laughs> okay, guys, good night. Arturo Gatti showing his dance steps as well. Now, Mickey Ward and Arturo Gatti provided great theatrics in the ring in their three fights. But Max, is this realistic to expect this to work as fighter and trainer, especially if the heat's on late in this fight? Well, as you mentioned, it worked for Rocky and Apollo, right? Uh, I, the way I see it, uh, Mickey Ward's job at this stage in Arturo Gatti's career is twofold. One, make sure the guy comes in in shape. He doesn't have to struggle to make the weight. It looks like Ward's done that. And two, make sure you have Gatti's undivided attention in the corner. Be hard to imagine that Mickey Ward, of all people, wouldn't have his undivided attention in the corner. 
the one thing that Ward brings, the quality he brings to Gotti's camp and to his corner that's most important is credibility. Mickey Ward has to be completely credible to Arturo Gotti. Speaking of credibility, we welcome in Hall of Fame trainer Emmanuel Stewart, who now joins us at ringside after Kermit Cintron's devastating win of Walter Matisse. What about Alfonso Gomez? We know he was on the TV show and he was in the contender, but this is a whole different setting against a different caliber fighter. You're right, and, and based on what has happened to most other guys who are from the contenders, they haven't did too well. As I told him yesterday, I say the reputation of the contenders and the credibility depends a lot on your fight tomorrow night. I think he brings a good fight, though. He's a perfect opponent for Gaddy, and if Gaddy can't get by him, he can't get by anybody. The guy is an aggressive guy, not a big puncher, so he's going to be right there. But still, we don't know what is left of Gaddy. Great to have you ringside, and of course, <laughs> Manny will also provide analysis for the Margarito Williams fight from Carson, California, as part of our triple header. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape for Arturo Gaddy and Alfonso Gomez here tonight in their 10 round welterweight showdown. Gaddy, of course, at 35 years of age. Gaddy on weight for the past two weeks, 146 pounds. Gomez comes in at the required 147 pounds. For the rules, our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. The Arturo Gaddy Alfonso Gomez fight is scheduled for 10 rounds, non time using the unified rules that you see on your screen. Bob, real quick, the four criteria that the judges will use to score each individual round, clean punching, effective aggressiveness, ring generalship, and defense with a strong emphasis on clean, effective punching. Bob! So Arturo Gatti and Alfonso Gomez getting set to start. Here comes Alfonso Gomez. He last fought on March the 30th. His dad has trained him. They've added Pepe Correa to the corner to work on some things as far as extending him and how he'll deal with stamina in this fight. What about keeping the emotions under check, Emmanuel? That's going to be a big factor, though. This is definitely, definitely a Gaddy Brown, and I don't think he's fought anywhere where he was so rude and, and unpopular as he's going to be tonight in this particular fight here. So a big part of his performance is going to be depend on how he can deal with this negative crowd. The well-educated young man who is taking classes and acting. He has a recording studio in his house. He felt that because he was a fan favorite on the contender, Max, that fans love him. But he's gotten a little bit of a rude awakening as he's come in because he's been booed. Well, he'll, he'll have to try and win the crowd over. And he's the type of fighter that maybe could do it. It's funny, this fight is like the anti, the anti Margarito Williams fight. Margarito, a guy everyone's avoided, fighting a guy in Paul Williams that he himself has avoided. Gotti's a guy everyone wants to fight because he's perceived as so beatable. And he finally settled on Gomez as an opponent because they view Gomez as so beatable. We're going to find out who's beatable over the next 10 rounds. Arturo Gatti for the eighth consecutive time fighting here at the Boardwalk Hall. Coming off a 356 day layoff. Thunderous applause for Thunder Gatti. Daniel, is it a factor, this long layoff, or did he need that time off? I think the layoff did him good. He needed to rest. But you know what's interesting to me, in all of the great fights that he's had, or hard fights, I should say, he still seems to have his reflexes, his coordination. Even the two fights he lost, I didn't see a loss in his coordination, which is amazing considering the wars he's been in. So I think you're going to see Gaddy looking very you good know, tonight. You know what, though, Emmanuel, what I have seen a loss in? Fans, attendance. If you look up in the rafters, this place is not completely full as it has been so often through Gotti's career. A ton of people are here. He's still a tremendous draw, but up here, up there, in the corners and the rafters where normally you'd see it filled to capacity, not quite what it's been in recent years in fights. But the approximate 10,000 that are here are cheering them. Tell you, regardless of what, if you can draw eight or nine and 10,000 people after getting stopped twice, that's amazing. So I think he's still a big attraction. Still a to big, me. still yeah. a big draw, no doubt about it. Yeah. Let's get the introductions for Michael Buffer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, by way of Caesars Atlantic City main events, is proud to present the featured bout of the evening. Sponsored by Nemiroff and sanctioned by the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board, Boxing Commissioner Larry Hazard Sr. This contest is also brought to you in association with Contenders Boxing. Scheduled for 10 rounds of boxing, this is in the welterweight division. 
At ringside, the three judges scoring this bout on the 10-point system. Pierre Benoist, Robert Grasso, and Steve Weisfeld. And inside the ring, your referee in charge of the action, Randy Newman. And now, for the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black, official weight, 147 pounds. His professional record, 16 victories, including seven knockouts, three defeats with two bouts even. Thomas y Caballeros de Guadalajara, Mexico, Alfonso S. Gomez. Be cheer. Be cheer. Be cheer. Across the ring, fighting out of the red corner, wearing white, trimmed with gold. Official weight, 146 pounds. His professional record stands at 40 victories including 31 knockouts with eight defeats and three world titles. Tonight, we turn the page to another chapter of boxing's human highlights saga from Jersey City, New Jersey. The former three-time world champion, the ultimate blood and guts warrior, Arturo Okay, gentlemen, you're both familiar with the rules as they've been thoroughly gone over. I want you to remember two things. I want you to obey my commands, but most importantly, defend yourselves at all times. Now shake hands and come out of the belt. So we are set, Arturo Gatti and Alfonso Gomez. Well, will this be a thanks for the memories, one last payday for Arturo Gatti? Or will he create some new memories, and as a result, will there be more to come? Round one scheduled for 10. Emmanuel, what does your trained eye look for early in this fight? Basically, I was looking to see the coordination and movement of Gaddy more so than I know what the Gomez has. And I'm, so far, he looks good. It, it, he's looking good at this stage here, but I know he'll start off boxing, but sooner or later, he's going to settle in and start slugging. Gaddy told us, yes, I've got to avoid the brawl. I have my power. I've given up lifting weights. Two weeks ago, when I was working a fight with Castillo, I, the first thing I noticed between him and Ricky Hedden was the footwork, the coordination right away. And I saw that uh, Castillo didn't have it. In this case here, Gaddy still does have his rhythm and his balance. Though he's being timed well by Gomez early here. Great left hand from Gomez. Gaddy says he's going to use movement. Gomez works the jab, left hand to the body. Gomez is very effective with his punches. He's pinpointing his punches right on the money. He's very Gomez. active punches. Get him up, get him up. Got a right hand from Gomez. The anticipation was Gomez would have to come on as the fight wore on. He seems to be coming out of the gate pretty fast here. He's coming out the fake fast and then working right behind a good left jab. But everything he's pointing is, is more accurate at this stage. And sooner or later, Gaddy's going to start slugging. Once he realizes he's being out of box, he's going to resort to slugging. Gomez has done a nice job keeping his emotions in check. Workman like here, first round. Gaddy trying to work his jab back. Jab again from Gomez. Pretty much 
which would you expect from Gomez? He's going to be right in front of you at all times, right? Yeah, but he's fighting a good fight. Now. He's not the fastest guy, but he's, his punches are very accurate. He's not wasting anything. All right, right. Get out of there clean. Don't throw, Mark. Don't throw. Danny misses with the right. It's a counter left from Gomez. Gomez is sharper. Between the two of them, he's just a hair sharper with his punches than Gaddy is at the stage right now. Good opening round for Alfonso Gomez. Here against Arturo Gaddy. Good round for Gomez. You're not hitting back, you're jabbing. You're leaving your hand to bring that left. Back up higher, all right, buddy? <coughs> bring it. Bro, bring that hand back up. Look at Don't pull back straight up. Pull back on an angle, all right, buddy? You can't stay right there with him. So you get that long right hand. You gotta move your head. As soon as you jab, move that head. Come back another jab. Those are combinations now, all right? He's right there to be hit, Tori. You gotta get all your hands up. <coughs> don't punch too far left. Okay. okay. Here you see Gomez land a right hand right on the chin over top of a lazy jab coming from Gaddy. And right here, you see him come back and land two left hands when Gaddy came in and left himself wide open. So at this stage, Gomez is counterpunching much more effectively than Gaddy is. 26-year-old Alfonso Gomez, born in Mexico, fighting out of Los Angeles, moved to Oakland at the age of 10. Wound up in the Napa area, could not get good sparring work, and has settled in Los Angeles. Crowd here in Atlantic City trying to rally Gaddy after a suspect round one. The Warriors already yeah. making an appearance. Gaddy, Gaddy, right, round. Gaddy now realizes that he's going to have to start fighting because he's, he's not winning the contest of boxing. So at this stage right now, you're going to see him make it an all out war. Is it too early to change from the strategy that you laid out? But I don't I don't think he has a choice because he realizes that he's being beaten by Gomez, so he's gonna start slugging them more and more as the fight goes on. And the right hand from Gomez. The impression is that the guy coming forward is the slugger and the guy moving back is the boxer. So far in this fight, we've seen even though Gotti is moving, it's Gomez who's outboxing Gotti with his timing. As Gomez told us when he was fighting in that contenders series, he was fighting guys 154 and 160 pounds. He says this is one of the few times he feels like he has a size advantage. And even though Gaddy is a welterweight, he never seemed to be. We seem like his best weight is about 143 pounds. He's somewhere between welterweight and junior welterweight. He's just not a big welterweight to me. Gomez appears very relaxed in the ring. Careful when you say that, Emmanuel. They'll make the super junior welterweight division about, yeah. <laughs> and give Gotti the belt. <laughs> yeah, they do have a weight division like for every seven pounds or six pounds. Gotti reaches in with the left hand. Garners some applause from the pro Gaddy crowd, but Gomez kind of sticks to his plan. Chopping right hand from Gomez. Gomez has been very effective with his right hand all night. Emmanuel, why is Gomez able to time Gotti like this? Is it because he doesn't respect what's coming back because he sees Gotti as a smaller guy? I just think it's just his timing is better. I think he's been busy fighting, even though. Uh, he hasn't been fighting big fights. He had a recent fight not too long back in England where he fought against a hostile crowd when they carried the contender guys over there. So he's used to that situation. But he's been busy, I think. And his right hand is very effective tonight over Gaddy's left shoulder. Final seconds of the second round. Alfonso Gomez fighting a very good fight through two. I got a negative. No te me vayas desesperando. 
Suavecito, suavecito. Catch the next Real Sports Tuesday night at 10 p.m. We profile Detroit Tiger slugger Gary Sheffield. In addition to being a prolific power hitter, is also one of the most outspoken and controversial personalities in the game today. July 24th, it's the return of Costas now. Host Bob sits down with a one-on-one -on -one with baseball commissioner Bud Sealing and Red Sox pitcher Kurt Schilling. But don't forget about it. Go to that fucking body. You hear me? That's the end. You can let double jab. Hard my head to the body. Relax, relax, and move, move, move your body, move your body, bend your waist. Find your distance now. Well, the fans here at the boardwalk call came to cheer Arturo Gatti, but right now it's Alfonso Gomez who's had the fun in the ring through the first two rounds. Gomez has been razor sharp with his power shots, especially the right hand through the first two rounds. He's hit on 26 of 55, according to CompuBox. Gaddy goes southpaw momentarily. There you go, punch. Step back. Each man one step back. Emmanuel, what can Gaddy do to sort of turn the tide here right now? Well, what I can say, I, would, uh, I, can, I think he's going to have to start slugging. I thought he was going to start that there earlier because the way he's going right now, systematically, Gobez is picking him apart. So often, we, we try to frame it as though a guy really can change a fight. You saw Gotti come out in this round bouncing. It was on his mind to use his athleticism and boxing skills, but he was still outboxed so far by Gomez. It didn't really change anything. The question is, whether he could do anything, box or slug. Well, Gomez is beating him without making a lot of motion, nothing flashy in effect, but every one of his punches is very effective and very well placed. It seems as though Gaddy's going to have to load up and catch some Gomez with something hard in order to change the fight. I agree, because the way it's going, he's, he's losing the fight systematically. And, you know, I thought he would have came back and started slugging more earlier. Gomez was cautioned for a shot on the belt line, and he scores a combination. On Gaddy. Uh, no punch, no punch. I'm in here. I'm in here. I'm in here. It's going to be interesting to hear how Mickey Ward instructs him in the corner as this fight progresses. Whether Mickey Ward also comes to that conclusion. Time to throw out a lot of the stuff they prepared and start throwing hard shots like that in an attempt to turn the fight. Well, when you consider the fact that Gomez is not known of being a knockout puncher, that is only chance really of turning this fight around the way it's going is to stay and start exchanging with it because Gaddy still is a tremendous puncher. And the fans here in Atlantic City trying to rally Gaddy. They can sense he needs a pick me up. Gomez just stays right in front of him and goes back to work. A professional performance so far by Alfonso Gomez. He's not wasting anything in terms of foot movement or hand movement. Every one of his punches are very well placed. One thing Gotti's movement, one way in which it's effective is Gomez has not been able to land three and four punches. It's been one and two at a time. And he missed with that short right hand in the waiting seconds of the third round. Gotta use that speed, all right, buddy? Use that speed, too. Come on, that's two. Don't pull that jab. Pull that jab down. All right, buddy? Jab right hook to him. Combination. You get it for more punches. All right? Move that head. Keep, it, keep that, bring that left hand up back up higher. It's coming, you're bringing it back too low. He's catching with that over here right. You gotta move your head, you gotta move out. Go All right, right. stop punching. All right. All right, buddy. All right. Combinations. Combinations, Tone. Tone, stay relaxed, nice and loose. Don't stay right there when we punch. One, two, three, get out. Use those legs. Those legs. Jab. jab, jab with pop. Pop the jab now. The game plan for Arturo Gatti was to become a boxer. 
But right now he's getting out box. Harold Letterman, your scorecard through three. Okay, Bob. Three to nothing, 30 to 27, Alfonso Gomez. Bob, you gotta give him credit for that straight right hand. I mean, this guy's standing flat-footed, bombing Arturo Gatti with right hands. Everybody said he wasn't a puncher, but God darn it, that right hand has got Gatti's face pretty well swollen. Anyway, based on clean punching, three to nothing, Alfonso Gomez. Manuel Gaddy wanted to outbox Gomez. Gomez, though, has controlled Gaddy. He's yeah. used the jab effectively. Yeah, because yeah, Gomez normally is the guy that we figured to be the aggressive guy coming in. But he's fighting. A, he's coming in, but he's coming in as a boxer, placing his punches very accurate. Much more different than I've ever saw him fight in the past. Guys, Gaddy just threw a home run right hand that didn't land. But he seems to intuitively know what Mickey's not telling him in the corner. Mickey is continuing to say one, two, three, and get out of there and continue to do what we've practiced, essentially. And Gotti is starting to load up a little bit more on some home run shots. Just a few seconds ago, though, it was Gomez who ripped the left hook. Gomez seems to be systematically not only just winning, but he seems to be taking the confidence away from Gotti instead of an expression of his face. Does it surprise you that Gomez has performed this well under this bright spotlight? I am surprised, especially in view of the uh, crowd and everything else. He's had a perfect, perfect fight. Daddy's fans trying to rally him again here in the fourth. Gomez is picking up the pressure a lot more now as he's coming in. Even though he's not coming in recklessly, he's picking up the pace a lot more. He's going make more aggressive. Big right hand. Gaddy has no answer for everything that's happening up there. He can't do anything about anything. Alfonso Gomez has been consistent through the first three-plus rounds. You know, Gotti's legs don't look terrible, and he's trying to do the right thing. And you think, well, what's the difference between this guy and the guy who thrilled everyone four or five years ago? Uh, at this level, even though this isn't the uppermost echelon, it's still a world-class level. A split second of, of, of reflexes go, and suddenly those punches that you were making miss, now they're hitting him. But you know, we better to give a little credit to Gomez. I don't think even if Mickey was like he was a couple years ago, he might have had a problem with Gomez. Gomez is fighting a tremendous fight. Good defense, placing his punches very well. Good left hand by Gomez, and he digs a left to the body. Good, strong jab by Gomez. Another stiff jab from Gomez. The jab's landing like a right hand. He is dominating Arturo Gatti. All right, buddy. Sit down and punch with those punches. Sit. Arturo, get to the body also. Don't. Get the head to him. Go with his body. You gotta, you gotta break his body down too, also. One. All right, buddy. All right, Joel. Listen to him. You're staying right there with him. We gotta use the speed. Use that jab. Once you punch, combination speed, get out. Don't stay there with him. You're gonna stay there with him. You're gonna have to throw some more punches downstairs. You hear me? All right. right here, you see a beautiful right hand, which he's been landing all night, straight across the shoulders. And then he's coming back with body shots and head shots. It's such a variety of punches, and Gaddy just cannot figure out what's happening. Now you see a beautiful left hand shot coming right back again on the chin. He's beating Gaddy to the punch. Well, according to Coffee Box in round number four, he landed 54% of his power shots and just a tick under 50% of his jabs. And his jabs have been damaging, Emmanuel. His jabs have been very effective as well as the right hand. And he's mixing in some nice body punches in between. For the first time, Gotti is pressing the action. This is what Gaddy's going to have to do. He should have did this earlier because he's got nothing to lose. He's got to make it a Gaddy fight. Forget the boxing. There's a jab from Gaddy. Stays right where he's been all fight. In front of Gaddy, pumping out that jab, shooting the right hand over the top. 
Gotti's punches at this point are slow and telegraphed. Well, we talked with Gomez yesterday. He was relaxed. He felt being the bigger man would be a key. Another left hand from Gomez, and everything he told us is sort of coming to fruition from his point of view. I mean, if Gomez were a puncher, this fight would have been over already. It's as if Gotti's fans are trying to will a rally out of him. But Gomez is lefts and rights are rally killers. To me, even though he's losing a round, I still think this is one of the better rounds for Gaddy. And that probably speaks volumes, you know, as to what Gomez has been able to do so far. I think I spoke too soon on that. <laughs> <laughs> this is got to go back four big shots as soon as I said that. But I thought that Gaddy had found the formula, which was just to make it a brawl, because he still is a big puncher. Gaddy tries to dig to the body, misses that wild left hand over the top. Gaddy shoots the counter right. Gomez always there for the response. Seconds of the fifth. Gomez darts away from any pressure. Go, buddy. Go, listen. You gotta work it in there. Work to the body, Joe. Listen. Go, will, will you, will you right keep here. your left hand down? Right here in his cup, in his cup. Go, listen. Keep that left hand up. And that's all he's catching with that right hand. Keep your hands up. You gotta stay in there. Use your leg, but you gotta stay in there, Joe. You gotta keep your hands up here, buddy. Forget so rolling like this. You're getting caught with that right hand. I'm gonna get a long right hand. You gotta keep that left hand up. You hear me? Atul, come on in there. Right in there. Right here, my hand, okay? Make him blink and throw the right hand. Give him the hook right hand back here. Got me? You got me? Give me the left hook right hand right back here. Put everything off your chair. Hey, you gotta pick your pace up. You're slowing it down with too much for this. Pick it up and turn him. Don't stand in that place on. Maybe see the hell of a way and then we'll pick it up. 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 Arturo Gatti and Alfonso Gomez begin round number six. Gomez has Pepe Correa, who he's brought in. He's got his dad in the corner, and mom Lillian always there as well. It's a family affair for the Gomez. And so far, they have to be enjoying what they're seeing. Yeah, it's a great night for them so far. You know, Emmanuel, you mentioned in the last shot about Gatti having to brawl more. At 35, coming off the Baldemir fight last year, is it a situation where the mind just might not be willing to go to that dark place? Yeah, I, I don't know, but, you know, he, uh, it, it could be that. But at this stage right now, you know, every time he's fought anybody that can box, he's always lost. They're inequality boxers. And, you know, what Gomez is doing is really doing a combination of boxing and punching with him. He's a little different. And, he's, and I've never saw him lose too much of a guy that fights like this yet. I mean, the truth is, in recent fights, almost no matter who got his fight, he's lost, he's fought, he's lost, period. Nice footwork by Gaddy and a nice pirouette. It's not going to win the round, though. Fights have been so dramatic that people continue to come back. And the question is if he continues. He's having a better round this round. But if he's dominated the whole way by a guy like Gomez, will they come back again? I would say no. I'd say this would be it right here. If he continues the way this fight is going, this would be the last one. He may fight more, but I don't think that they'll support him the way he has. Won't be in, in front of 10,000 fans. Arturo Gatti that 
seems content to box, and it doesn't work. And he still can't get away from the right hand of Gomez. Right hand again from Gomez. He always has that right hand to answer. Daddy trying to work his jab. We're almost through six rounds here. Arturo Gatti and Alfonso Gomez, part of our welterweight triple header, still to come. Antonio Margarito will put his belt on the line against Paul Williams in Carson, California. For an update, we send it to Carson, California and Jim Lampley. All right, thank you, Bob Papa. And here's a look at the Home Depot Center in Carson, California, home of the giant outdoor soccer facility, the stadium that David Beckham is expected to fill up sometime in the next few years. Paul Williams and Antonio Margarito will come close to filling the next door tennis arena for boxing tonight. There's Williams, the unbeaten fighter from Aiken, South Carolina, who hopes to get the 33-0 tonight against the man so avoided by top names in the welterweight division in recent years, Antonio Margarito. 34 and 4, but all four of the de defeats somewhere in his background since becoming a force in the welterweight division. Margarito has been difficult for everyone. We'll see how difficult he is for Williams tonight. Let's go back to Atlantic City now. All right, Jim, speaking of difficulties here in Atlantic City, it's been a difficult night so far for Arturo Gatti against Alfonso Gomez. Gomez has controlled this fight with his jab, his right hand. Harold Letterman, your scorecard through six. <laughs> hey, Bob, do you think anyone can win the fight doing the alley shuffle? In any case, five rounds to one, uh, Alfonso Gomez. I thought that Alfonso really didn't do a lot in the sixth round. Just like Max Kellerman said, I, I thought that Arturo Gatti had a better round than round six, but he used his left jab. You know, Bob, what I always start to, to wonder about Arturo Gatti, as he goes into the late rounds of every fight, watch how many right hands he throws. You know, he's got that really, really bad right hand. When he starts to throw less right hands, he becomes more ineffective. In any case, five rounds to one, Alfonso Gomez. All right, Harold, and Gomez hitting Gaddy on the back of the head as Gaddy was in a prone position. Looks like there's a little giving Gaddy now as that left hook to the body starts to land for Gomez. Double right hand from Alfonso Gomez. Digs in with the left. Right hand over the top. He's just measuring Gaddy. Some punches back here. Right. Okay. Right. Right. No stand and count. Gaddy shoots a left. Gomez right on him. And forces the clinch. We're watching the destruction of an action hero. Maybe his case as a Hall of Famer is overstated and was not a great fighter but was a truly great action fighter, and in that way, a legendary fighter. And unless he can come up with something incredibly dramatic here, this looks like the end of the road as a significant fighter. And Randy Newman, the referee, moves in for a close look. He's giving Gaddy, based on his pedigree, the benefit of the doubt. from Larry Hazard has always erred on the side of caution and if no one else was going to stop it not that Randy Newman wouldn't have but he took matters into his own hand and you don't mind seeing that and Emmanuel let's hope this is the end for Arturo Gatti because yeah. he got pummeled by a guy who's not known as a big puncher. No, that's the end of it. Regardless of whether he wants to fight or not, he's, he's finished. Gomez yes. landed 40 of 62 power shots in the last round.
Arturo Gatti took tremendous punishment throughout the balance of this fight. And got dropped in the seventh round. Randy Newman gave him the benefit of the doubt as far as letting this continue. In most cases, he probably would have stepped in. And Larry Hazard runs the New Jersey State Athletic Commission, came through the ropes himself to make sure that this was stopped. Larry Hazard was one of the greatest referees that I've ever saw when he was refereeing before he was named to be the commissioner for New Jersey. All right, let's take a look at the early part of round number seven where Gomez just put his punches together right hands double right hand right there. You know we're, we're all looking at Gaddy is not what it used to be but I think a lot of this was just Gomez is a hell of a fighter and fought a hell of a fight and even if Gaddy was in his prime I think he would have had problems with Gomez. And Randy Newman was taking a close look he was giving Gaddy an opportunity to try to hang on. Well you have to because Gaddy still explodes and comes back even when he's in trouble. That's his history. But in this case here Gomez was not to be denied. And there is the right hand that put Gaddy down flush to the mouth and jaw. And again it was Gomez gets the left hand good strong jab and then the right hand over the top. And I hope for that to be the last right hand that we'll ever see Gaddy take. And Alfonso Gomez with a tremendous performance and Arturo Gatti just overwhelmed by the sharp boxing and the sharp right hands from 26 year old Alfonso Gomez. And there's the right hand that put Gatti down and ended his night and probably his career for the official time of the stoppage. Once again our ring announcer Michael Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, this bout comes to an end at 2 minutes 12 seconds of round number 7. The winner by knockout victory from Guadalajara, Mexico, Alfonso S. Gomez. So Alfonso Gomez with a dominant performance against Arturo Gatti here in Atlantic City New Jersey from the very beginning of this fight the opening bell he was dominant in this fight and the numbers will support that as you get a look at the total punch numbers in this fight that only went into the seventh round 46 percent for Gomez he landed 216 he was outstanding with the jab and the power punches as well that right hand found its mark throughout the course of this fight 142 connects. 52 percent as he more than doubled up Gaddy as far as the amount of power punches thrown. Alfonso Gomez comes to Atlantic City and wins in dominant fashion. He's with Max Kellerman. Congratulations Alfonso on a thoroughly dominant performance. I asked you before the fight what were you thinking. You said you were focused on the fight. What were you thinking the moment it was stopped. Well I tried to stop him in that corner but he can take a lot of punches so the referee likes him a lot because he was taking a lot of shots and I was running out of gas. But you know I knew he was going to start swinging because that's what he usually does. So I started ducking down trying for him to get tired because you get tired when you swing and you don't make the punch. But uh, when they stopped that I was glad because you know I was kind of looking in the corner of my eye in that corner to see if uh, maybe Mickey War jump in the ring but he, I, I didn't see him move so I just continued pressuring him. Are you saying that you were running out of gas because you were throwing so many punches. Yeah a little bit I, I didn't want to like run out of gas and then maybe he can continue the next round and you know I made that mistake kind of like Oscar De La Hoya does sometimes. Did you have any fear be, uh, of doing that because it is Arturo Gatti we've seen him come back a million times. Well you know I kind of felt his punch in the first round and in the fourth round I think but not enough to like hurt me. But I knew he was going to start swinging. I just knew it. As soon as he flinched, I just ducked down because I knew he wasn't going to go anywhere by my head. Both of your fists seem to have homing devices on them. You hit him so easily with both hands throughout the fight. The left jab, the straight right hand, you even mixed in hooks to the body. Why was it so easy to hit him? Because we practice that. Um, we practice a lot of jabs, a lot of working on my distance, not his distance. Because if, if we are his distance, he's in an advantage and not me. So we work on throwing the long jabs, the fainting with the jabs, and then the right hands, and definitely the hook to the bodies, which is my uh, signature punch. Okay. Life's not fair. This business is not fair. You know, people will now say, well, Gomez ran into an old Gaddy, a smaller Gaddy, a Gaddy who was at the end of the line. How do you respond to that kind of commentary? Nothing. 
<laughs> no, I don't respond to anything. I just do my job. Whoever my next opponent is, you know, if it's a ranked fighter or some, uh, somebody just to fight or a world champion, whatever, I'm going to do my job. If I lose, I lose. And if I win, I win like I did this time. So, you know, I did my job. I was in great shape and I did it. How would, who would you like to fight next? It doesn't matter. That's not my job. My job's to go. But who would you like to fight next? Well, uh, let's say Julio Zara Chavez Jr. I've always admired his father. To me, he's the best Mexican fighter to come out of Mexico. He's my idol, he still is. And when I was a kid, I always dreamed about taking his place as a Mexican idol. But now his kid wants to do it, so how about we fight for it and see who actually is the next Mexican idol. Congratulations, Alfonso. Bob? Uh, well, I just want to say hi to my family in Guadalajara and Alaska and, and, and Oakland. And my, and my, and my fiance, I, I love you. And to my clan too. I love you, baby, bye. Thank you. Family all over the world, Bob. Well, Alfonso Gomez came into this hostile environment, Emmanuel Stewart, and he did his job. Forget about Gaddy's age and everything else. He came in, he fought a very professional fight, and he showed very good skills in the ring because he stuck with a game plan. Yeah, they had did their homework in terms of Gaddy. They were shooting short little right hands right across the shoulders, no long right hands, so they was real prepared. In fact, they were speaking of the fact that Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. was going to fight Gaddy if he had won. I never wanted to even think about that. But I am excited about the fight that Gomez just mentioned of him fight Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. I think that would be a fantastic fight. You know, it was interesting because Arturo Gaddy left the ring. Uh, Max did not have a chance to interview him. We'll try to get an interview with Arturo Gaddy, and we'll bring that to you later in the telecast because, of course, we have Antonio Margarito and Paul Williams still to come. But for Arturo Gaddy, what we saw at the end, hopefully that was the last right hand he eats in his career. Yeah, that was, he took a terrible beat tonight, and that was, was a guy who wasn't really a puncher. But Gomez looked good, though. I think he would have been a problem for Gaddy even if when Gaddy was in his prime. Emmanuel, a pleasure as always. Uh, Max Kellerman has returned from the ring, and Max, uh, you know, he was confident yesterday when we spoke with him. He talked about fighting bigger men, fighting people at junior middleweight and middleweights in the contender and elsewhere, and everything he told us really kind of came to fruition tonight. It did, but you know, I'm thinking of Arturo Gatti. That was the story coming into this fight. That's the guy we were watching. And, you know, his entire career has really been, look, Obviously, the guy had superhuman courage and thrilled us all because of that courage, not only the punch, but the courage to deliver those bombs even in the face of tremendous adversity. But as much as his career was a story of that courage, it was a story of very smart matchmaking when he won. You had Gotti's people always had to be careful the way they matched him. His best performance was probably occurred 10 years ago at junior lightweight against Tracy Harris Patterson when he won that fight on the left jab. That was probably his best performance in terms of the level of guy he fought and the level of guy he beat and was able to outbox. Since then, his signature wins and fights Ivan Robinson, Mickey Ward, have not been against upper echelon guys. When he fought upper echelon guys, or even difficult guys style-wise like Angel Manfredi, he lost. We're two-thirds of the way through our welterweight triple header. We started with Kermit Cintron dismantling Walter Matisse in the second round, and then Arturo Gatti at 35 years of age stepping into the ring against Alfonso Gomez. And in round number seven, Alfonso Gomez, who had dominated this fight from the very beginning, landed a thunderous right hand to Thunder Gatti, and the fight was stopped in the seventh round as Alfonso Gomez pulls off the upset here in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Our triple header continues. Antonio Margarito and Paul Williams still to come as Alfonso Gomez celebrates his victory in Arturo Gatti's backyard. The triple header continues in Carson, California with Margarito and Williams as we send it out to Jim Lampley and Larry Merchant. And welcome to the Home Depot Center in Carson, California for now the main event of our special two-site triple header. Moments from now, 147-pound titleist Antonio Margarito faces off with undefeated Paul Williams in a bout which stands to have big impact on the talent-laden welterweight division. Hello again, I'm Jim Lampley. In a moment, you'll be hearing from HBO boxing analyst Larry Merchant. Very quickly, let's take a look at the graphic with which we, we began the evening, looking at some of the very top names in the welterweight division, and obviously, 
Uh, the biggest splash of the evening so far has been scored by Kermit Sindron with his spectacular second round knockout victory over Walter Matisse. Now Margarito and Paul Williams will buy to see who gets removed from the bottom half of that graphic. The other half of the story in Atlantic City of course is uh, the loss for Arturo Gatti and this would seem to be Larry Merchant the logical end of Gatti's long and overwhelmingly entertaining career. Uh, a final word from you on what happened to Gatti tonight against Alfonso Gomez who was totally prepared and did his job. The sand ran out of his hourglass Jim. But that was some hourglass for a long time. I happen to uh, collect glass art uh, and hourglasses are not among them. But if there was one that had Gaddy's signature on it, I would want it. Uh, you don't make many like Gaddy. If you could, other fighters would try to do what he did, but they couldn't. He, he left us with some sand in that hourglass that we'll never forget. And while Bob Papa suggested to you in Atlantic City that we might hear from Gaddy later on in the telecast, that turns out to be a false hope as Arturo has been taken to a hospital in Atlantic City for observation. Obviously, we wish him well. Now let's get ready for unbeaten Paul Williams against Antonio Margarito in a matchup of two fighters who have been dominant against their opponents in the welterweight division. Larry, how should one choose the winner in this battle between Margarito a hardened durable proven welterweight still in his prime and Williams a young fighter of obviously spectacular physical potential who may not yet have been tested in the way Margarito has with absolute unshakable conviction <laughs> that your man not only can't lose but that he must and will win the supporters of Margarito note with great pride that Floyd Mayweather turned down a very sizable offer to fight Margarito, a negative that turned out to be a positive. And who they ask is Paul Williams anyway. The supporters of Paul Williams are absolutely certain that they have a star, a future uh, man of the boxing who will carry us forward for years to come. A freakily tall man uh, who is freakily talented as well. And they note that Margarito uh, has a negative. That negative is that he has never actually beaten anyone of substance in the ring either. So Jim, let's settle this argument where it should be, in the ring. <laughs> And it's going to happen in a few minutes. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape now for Antonio Margarito against Paul Williams. One of the intriguing elements of the fight height for both fighters. You see the four year age advantage for Williams at age 25. Margarito's a tall welterweight at five feet 11. Larry Merchant described Paul Williams he heard as freakishly tall six feet one. Some people like to say he's six two. an arm length advantage of only a half inch however for the fighter from Aiken South Carolina measured from the armpit to the end of the fist. They both weighed in more than a pound under the hundred forty seven pound limit suggesting the serious serious nature of the training that both fighters bring to this fight and coming into the ring unofficially tonight. Margarito has added 11 and a quarter pounds up to 157. Paul Williams adding nearly 17 pounds all the way up to 162 overnight. Take a look at some punch stat numbers coming in. The average welterweight counted by CompuBox, meaning good welterweights. The average good welterweight lands, or I should say throws, somewhere between 50 and 60 punches per round. These guys throw twice that many. Margarito counted over the course of several fights averaging 116 punches per round. Paul Williams also averaging more than 100 punches per round. Who will be able to get off at that level of output in tonight's fight. Whichever one it is is likely to be the winner. Rules of the bout. And with Harold Letterman uh, back on the East Coast in Atlantic City. I will tell you that these are the unified rules of the Association of Boxing Commissions. There's no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight. You go to the scorecards after any foul at the end of round four and you cannot be saved by the bell in any of the 12 rounds for which we're scheduled tonight. And now here comes Paul Williams who has been waiting and waiting and waiting for this fight. 
He, by his estimation, has had three separate training camps to prepare for Antonio Margarito. The last of them took place in Red Hot, Puerto Rico. And Williams says, I was waiting for Margarito to make up his mind whether he was going to fight Miguel Cotto and me, or, or me. And the choice to fight Williams instead of Cotto came as a surprise to Margarito's promoter, Bob Arum. It was a surprise to everyone because Cotto is the bigger fight. The victory over Cotto would vault Margarito into the elite echelon of the division. I think the crowd response here is partially reflective of the larger number of fans in Southern California who root for Margarito, born in nearby Torrance, now living in Tijuana just below the border. But also it reflects the degree to which Paul Williams excites the masses. The idea of a six foot one inch American welterweight with punching power, well, you go back to the days of Tommy Hearns in the early 1980s for the obvious comparison. This will provide the test of whether he belongs on top or whether he is not just freakily tall, but just a freak and not a true boxer, puncher. Now next to walk will be Antonio Margarito, and as you have so deftly pointed out, Larry, it's interesting that Margarito's biggest credentials go not to the fighters whom he has fought and beaten, but the guys who did not choose to fight him. Both Shane Mosley and Floyd Mayweather reportedly turning down $8 million paydays to fight Antonio Margarito. That gave him an aura of danger. He's one of those fighters, Jim, whose sum is greater than its parts. Not a great puncher, not a flashy boxer. He is just all fighter. But for one reason or another, he's sort of fallen through the cracks of the welterweight division in terms of his exposure and in terms of fan popularity. 8,000 people have bought tickets here. A large enough number for the house to be called a sellout, although not all the seats are yet filled. Perhaps some still late arriving in the Los Angeles tradition. If you're looking for a dark side of Margarito's record coming in, it is that his big slip up in the past few years, his one loss three years ago was against Daniel Santos in Puerto Rico. Santos, a tall southpaw, over six feet tall. Now here he goes again against another tall southpaw, over six feet tall. But completely different styles, and that's his only loss in 10 years. I think we can give him that. Crowd welcomes Antonio Margarito to the ring. About 12 miles from where he was born in Torrance, California. One interesting insight into Margarito. He's been married for eight years. He and his wife decided they would not start a family until he got to where he wanted to be as a fighter. They don't have any children yet. Very professional attitude every day in every way from Margarito. Williams says, I can bring the same thing. Let's go to Jimmy Lennon Jr. for the in the ring introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and we welcome you to beautiful Southern California and the Home Depot Center here in the city of Carson for Pride and Punishment and our featured bout of the evening brought to you by Goosen Tudor Promotions and sponsored by Reebok and the beautiful Caribbean island of St. Lucia. This bout coming away is sanctioned by the WBO president and supervisor is Francisco Valcarcel, along with the California State Athletic Commission, the executive officer Armando Garcia. Introducing to you our judges, scoring this bout from ringside, from West Covina, California, David Mendoza, from Mineral Ridge, Ohio, Tom Miller, and from Santa Clara, California, Marty Salmon. And our third man of the ring, the referee in charge of this bout, Dr. Lou Moretz. 
All right, fans, here we go. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBO Welterweight Championship of the World. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance and boxing fans joining us around the world, live from Carson, California, it's time for the main event of the evening. Introducing to you first, on my left, the challenger fighting out of the blue corner, wearing green trunks with white trim. He hails from Aiken, South Carolina. He weighed in at a trim and ready 145 and one half pounds. He is undefeated in his campaign in the ring with 32 wins, no losses, 24 wins coming by way of knockout. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the NABO champion, ranked the WBO number one welterweight contender. Please welcome the undefeated challenger, Paul the Punisher Williams. And his opponent across the ring. On my right, the defending world champion fighting out of the red corner, wearing black trunks with red, green, and white trim, and hailing from Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. He weighed in already 145 and three quarter pounds. His record 34 wins, four losses, one no contest, and 24 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, he is making the eighth defense of his title. Please welcome the WBO welterweight champion of the world, introducing Antonio Margarito. Once again, a referee in charge, Dr. Lou Moret, now to give instructions. Early in fights, most fighters just look for the right combination to uh, open their opponent's lock. These fighters just want to blow up the safe. I don't know when I've seen a fighter more visibly ecstatic to be in the ring for a big event than Paul Williams, who was grinning openly through all of the pre-fight pageantry and who starts off at a very fast pace against Antonio Margarito. Margarito hasn't thrown a punch yet. Williams is already into double figures. Margarito is blocking most of those punches. Neither guy tries to land at an exceptionally high percentage. Both try to just keep throwing. Margarito in what was regarded as an off-form performance in his last fight against Joshua Clotty, broke a welterweight record by throwing 1,500 plus punches in 12 rounds. There you see him chasing Williams around the ring for the opportunity to get off a couple more. Margarito has begun to go to the body early. Williams' tall, lanky form may offer body angles to Margarito, who's a pretty devoted body puncher, particularly with the left hook. Williams seems to be poised in the ring with a title holder on the title holder's home turf. Doesn't seem to be flustered at all. Seems calm. Professional. And when Williams landed a chopping left hand across the top, 
Margarito grinned at him. A good left hand by Williams that landed right on the chin. He's getting a lot of punches off here in the first round, and Margarito seems just a bit taken back by the enormous activity level that Williams is producing. Paul Williams has been saying for weeks, I sparred with him three years ago. I got the better of him in sparring. I cut him. I hurt him to the body. They had to make me go home. Margarito says, what is he talking about? He was just another guy. It was a sparring session like any other. Big right hook by Paul Williams. One thing that Williams seems to do intuitively is not throw every punch at the same velocity. Sometimes he lightens up, then he throws something heavier. That's a good sign for his young professional career. If either fighter has presented something of a puzzle in round one to the other, it would certainly appear that Williams, with his range and his volume of punches, has thrown Margarito for a little bit of a loop. We'll see what adjustments are going to be made between rounds. Yeah, don't get over to Garfield. He's waiting for you. Move, keep moving your ways. Block his punches. Then try to get in there. Your head is up too high. Come on, you're too, when you're too close, yeah. throw that uppercut. But give me some more feints as you deliver. Because you got in there so that whenever you faint, he reacts. That's where you want him is to take his balance. You got his balance. Deep breath. You're doing good, brother. Okay? All right, let's go, let's go. Do the same thing, brother. They were all smiles in Paul Williams' corner between rounds. Larry, you made a great point before the fight. Two guys who average 100 punches per round. Doesn't seem likely that both of them can get off 100 punches per round. In round one, Williams threw 114 punches, landed 21. Margarito threw only 42 punches, landing only four. Now, he has sometimes started more slowly in the past, but that's a markedly slow start against Williams' blazing beginning. And there's a straight left hand that lands for Williams, and a sweeping left hand that lands for Williams, and a combination to the body, and Margarito hasn't unlocked the puzzle yet. Margarito trying to force his way inside to neutralize that reach advantage. Perfectly well said. It seems as though Margarito's idea here is simply to move forward and try to pressure at all costs. But Williams is succeeding in this round, hitting Margarito as he's coming in and getting off first again with that combination. Now Margarito begins concertedly going to the ribcage to try to slow Williams down. He's going to have to invest in body punching in the early rounds so that the speed differential isn't as big in the later rounds. Hard right hand across the top from Margarito. He throws that jab, Jim, almost like a backhand. It's like a flick, a hard flicking jab. Bringing it up from the waist, and now he snaps Margarito's head back with a straight left hand. And Margarito wants to answer right away, and answers with a hard right. Margarito bombing to the body with his right hand. And Margarito smiling, but Williams still punching. Good left uppercut hook, whatever that punch was. He's one of those fighters who can throw punches from all angles, and that creates problems for opponents. Margarito pressuring forward, but eating leather as he goes. Williams once again throwing in the neighborhood of 100 punches here in the second round. But now Margarito has stepped up his punch count 
He's gotten off 80 in this round. Big left hand to the body by Margarito. Williams comes back with a combination upstairs. It's gonna be an all-action fight for as long as they can go. Immediately following our live boxing tonight, stay tuned for the premiere of Countdown to Hopkins Wright. A behind-the-scenes look at Bernard Hopkins and Winky Wright as they prepare for their upcoming showdown in Saturday, July 21. HBO Pay-Per-View brings you the live fight between Hopkins and Wright, two of the sport's most accomplished performers. He's going to cooperate. Don't worry about that. And when it comes down for him to cooperate, you will know, and you step to him. But just keep on touching it like you're doing, touching it like you're doing, touching it like you're doing. Give it Straight right hand down the middle. Don't let him hit you. Yeah, you, you got to block his shots, block him, and then cut the... And don't let him out. Have him right in your right hand. Paul Williams threw 114 punches in round one, threw 106 punches in round two. You can see that Harold Letterman, scoring on video from the East Coast, has given Williams each of the first two rounds. Our Emmanuel Stewart, also watching on video from the East Coast. Emmanuel, what do you think of what you've seen from Williams and Margarito so far? Well, first of all, it's really hard for me to believe that it's only two inches in height difference. It looks more like four inches in height difference. And uh, Williams is winning the fight because he's just busy. He's taking advantage of his height and actually fighting like a tall guy the way he's handling uh, Margarita. Margarita looks to me exceptionally slow tonight. And uh, Williams is winning the fight by just simply staying busy and keeping him at a distance. Are you but surprised? You don't know what's going to happen going. But, but Williams is not punching with power. As Larry pointed out earlier, he's flicking his punches. His punches are not even, gloves are not even closed. Are you surprised at all, Emmanuel, by the level of relaxation that Williams has shown? even on the walk-in for his first assignment at this level. I am somewhat surprised at that, but I'm, I'm equally surprised it seemed like the, the, the slower and it seemed like no intensity coming from Margarita. He's fighting so slow and lethargic. Loth Emmanuel Stewart joining us from the East Coast in Atlantic City. All right, stop. Where earlier tonight, the fighter that he trains and manages, Kermit Cintron, scored a big second-round knockout of Baltimore now the contact is increasing here in round three. Now they're at it. Margarito landing his best shots so far. In the body. Margarito devotedly going to the body now. You can see his eyes low, fixed low, on Williams' waistline. Well, all he's got to do is look Punch straight ahead, there. Jim, and he'll be at his waistline. <laughs> oh, there's that left-hand punch that comes up and under, and again, it landed okay, for stop, Paul Williams stop. as Margarito basically leaned right oh, into it, oh, oh, trying to get in position to throw a body shot. You know, for a tall, young fighter, he sometimes fights exceptionally well on the inside, Jim. Big left hand over the top by Williams. And go, don't hit me on the head. Paul Williams still holds the initiative now as we come down the stretch in round number three. This is the third fight on our welterweight triple header. As we reach the bell, we're going to take you quickly back to Atlantic City for Bob Popper to recap what happened earlier this evening in Cintron Matisse and Gatti versus Gomez. Bob. All right, Jim, we started things off with Kermit Cintron and Walter Matisse with Cintron's belt on the line. Matisse went down at the end of round number one. In round number two, Cintron dropped him one time and then a second time with a powerful combination. He was quicker, sharper, more accurate. Kermit Cintron, his 26th stoppage. Then Arturo Gatti took center stage against Alfonso Gomez from the contender. Gomez dominated this fight from the very beginning. Put his punches together, Gatti never had an answer. In round number seven, Gomez was able to step up the pace and that right hand there ended the night for Arturo Gatti 
and ended his career as Alfonso Gomez comes up with the victory. Max Kellerman had a chance to talk with Arturo Gatti afterwards before he went to the hospital. We'll have that interview after Margarito and Williams. Back to Jim in Carson, California. And we're back in Carson, California for the fourth of the schedule 12 between Paul Williams and Antonio Margarito. Paul Williams starts out the fourth round trying to throw a big left hand across the top. Harold Letterman scoring at ringside in Atlantic City. Harold, how do you have it so far? Okay, Jim. Three to nothing, 30 to 27, Paul Williams. You know, Jim, if you've ever seen Paul Williams fight before, 32 times he stepped in the ring and he's doing exactly what he's doing tonight. I know. Oh, I mean, he holds you off with that right jab. He just throws a million red jabs at you. He comes across with that straight left hand. He throws combinations. He doubles and triples that right jab. You know, he, and when you get in close, he locks you up just like he's doing here to Margarito. Margarito's going to have to come in with some straight body shots, not wide shots to slow this kid down. Or, or Williams is going to box him to death. Three to nothing, Paul Williams. You know, sometimes you don't see the same fight on television as you see in person, as Harold himself has pointed out. But uh, we can't disagree with him being ringside. New information from Atlantic City. I'm told that we did access a last-minute interview with Arturo Gatti. Uh, and we will hope to show it to you later on. Gatti has something to say about whether his career has any remaining future at this point. And we'll bring that to you, obviously, after the conclusion of this fight in Carson between Williams and Margarita. As tall and flexible as Williams is, he seems to sometimes just slingshot his punches. I get the picture that he's David and Goliath. David fighting the title holder, Goliath being the bigger man. Just want to make clear that when we bring you the Arturo Gatti interview before the end of the evening, Gatti will announce his retirement in the interview. Actually, did announce his retirement in the interview. So be sure to stay tuned to hear to hear what you now know, which is that Arturo Gatti announced his uh, retirement in the interview that we're going to bring him. Hard right hand by Antonio Margarito. A grinning Margarito makes clear that he needs to make every punch count against the landslide of punches he's facing still into the fourth round from Paul Williams. It's almost, his grin is almost like he's saying, take your best shots, kid. Let's see what happens in the second half of the fight. And now fight. Margarito starts talking trash to Williams, banging away at the body. And Williams, just as relaxed as ever, pops with the jab and moves away. A fourth consecutive round with more than 100 punches thrown for Paul Williams. Move the waist, blocking his punches, and, and then keep, keep it a distance. Just the water. You got to work with speed like you're doing. Okay, so me some more faint and give me that more jab. Some more hooks are gonna work, and some more uppercuts are gonna work. Okay, but don't get in there and push you with it. Got it. Here you see Williams landing uppercuts because for whatever reason, everything Margarita's doing is wide and he leaves a big gap right in the center. And Williams is taking advantage of it by landing punches right in between the gloves of Margarita as he's coming in. Down view box numbers in the fourth round. Margarito 12 out of 40. Williams 20 out of 104. So for a guy who in the past has averaged 116 punches thrown per round in fights counted by CompuBox, Margarito has been something entirely different tonight, trying to choose the spaces between the constant flow of punches from Paul Williams. It's Williams who's able to stick with his game plan, stick with his previous routine, throwing in excess of 100 punches per round. Margarito's goal, obviously, to make his punches count more, to do damage, to hurt Williams, particularly to the body. So far, Paul Williams seems to have the edge 
as we're into the fifth of a scheduled 12. Here's where he changes up. He moves back, he moves back. Now he stands right in front of you, giving you different looks. What's interesting to me, Jim, is you would think a tall fighter like this is vulnerable to the body, that even a good fighter like Margarito cannot get there consistently. Well, some of the time you just have to defend because Paul Williams is throwing, throwing, throwing. And when you look at that body, there was a time years ago when one of the women who worked for George Peterson and Peterson's amateur boxing organization said to him, what are you going to do with this kid? He doesn't have a muscle anywhere in his body. Peterson said, if you listen to me, I'll make him a world champion. He's got a chance to win that belt tonight. And he's going after it with gusto. So far, Margarito's face is holding up against the onslaught. But you wonder when you're going to see an eye begin to swell or blood from the nose because Williams is throwing so freely and landing a lot of the time. Now, for the first time in the fight, Williams seems to seek a little bit of a breather as he finds space in the fifth. Yeah, it, he has impressive, really uh, adult poise, I want to say, Jim. An intuitive feel about how to change up, back off, come forward. in the center of the ring. And referee Lou Filippo, or Lou Moret, I should say, Lou Perret will rule that seconds. a slip. Between rounds, we're going to show you highlights of a fast-rising young Hispanic-American heavyweight. Mexican-American heavyweight prospect Chris Ariola from here in the Los Angeles area had his 21st professional fight tonight against Derek Berry, who's not expected to be a tough test for Ariola, and expectations proved correct. Finding a former sparring partner, it's only, even, even in the land of building up resumes, this is a bit under the top. But I like Ariola. He has to prove himself against a substantial opponent. Go. Give me some body work. He can take a head shot, but give me some body work. Okay? I thought Margarita won the last round. Is that the start of the rest of the fight? Paul Williams still averaging 99 punches per round. He's landed 102 out of 498. Counted by CompuBox through the first five rounds. Margarito landing 47 out of 202 in that same span. So Margarito has been more than doubled in punch output. And once again, Williams gets off a flurry to start round six. Right hand across the top by Margarito. Williams taking the punch well and delivering in return. Clean, clean, break clean. Most Margarita watchers consider him a much better puncher with the left hand than with the right. If he's got a money punch, it's the left hook. Harder to land against the southpaw stance. Crushing right hand inside, landed to the jaw by Margarito. Williams keeps flowing. Body shot by Margarita. Starting to land with more effect. And now Williams puts up the left hand to try to block the right as Margarito continues to sweep it and land upstairs. Good hard left to the body by Margarito. Williams fires back a four-punch combination. Lands a straight left right on the chin of Antonio Margarito. And another. Margarito taking all of this very well and continuing the throwback. Both fighters getting hit and fighting back. 
Emmanuel Stewart, do you see any change in momentum now at this point with Margarito clearly more determined to fight back? Yeah, but, but still, uh, Williams seems to be unraveled. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's being pressured a lot more, but he seems to be very cool. Uh, I think Margarita is, is, is doing better, but still, that's still not enough. His punches are too wide. He's, he's not shooting any straight right hands at all. Yeah. And, and, and Paul Williams is just out working. I mean, just regardless of what happened, Paul would not let Margarita take control over the fight. You know, we've talked about Beckham in this facility, the movie based on his celebrity called Bend It Like Beckham. And boxing is better to throw it straight like Clemens than bending it like Beckham. And in this fight, Williams is throwing more of the straight punches. continually pressing forward, pressing forward, trying to build up more punch output. He's thrown 60 punches in this round. Williams once again approached 100. Wednesday, August 8th, tune into the premiere of Hard Knocks Training Good Camp for the Kansas City Chiefs for an all-access look at what happens between the scenes at an NFL training camp. Every Wednesday night for five weeks, we'll take you inside the locker room, the meeting rooms, and everywhere you can imagine as Coach Herm Edwards pairs down his roster and readies the Chiefs for the upcoming season. We'll keep moving and... Yeah, all right. Yeah. He's, he's keeping you over the balance. Yeah, but throw punches. Don't stand without throwing punches. Yeah, come on, let's go. Come on, wake up. We're going to win. Okay, you know, Paul, you can't do that, huh? Copy box numbers in the sixth round. Margarito reached his high water level of the fight, landing 17 out of 44. Williams, 22 out of 101. Harold Letterman, how'd you score the first six? You know, Jim, in round six, Antonio Margarito really started to pick it up early in the round. But then in the second half of the round, Paul Williams totally outworked him to win that round. I mean, Margarito's not fighting like a guy who's urgent, who, who feels that he's losing his fight. I mean, he's got to pick up the pace soon. He's got to really start to come in and land some real hard shots to slow this kid down because Paul Williams is totally outworking him. Six to nothing, 60 to 54, Paul Williams. I have it five no, rounds go, to Paul, one. Emmanuel, Margarito's grinning in there as though he thinks he knows something. Does he, or well, is he grin grinning through the dark? Well, he's grinning through the dark, as I'm concerned, because Paul Williams is not going to let him take control over this fight. And I don't think he has the work ethics to, to punch with enough regularity to slow Williams down. He may have his spots here and there, but Williams is steadily punching, slipping, twisting, turning, and very relaxed. So I think Williams can continue to go the whole fight at this pace. We've seen Margarito come back in the second half of fights where he's had difficulty early on. Against Daniel Santos in Puerto Rico, he was coming on fast toward the end of the fight, seemingly overtaking Santos on scorecards before the fight was stopped as the result of a cut. And Santos wound up with a razor-thin technical decision. But even when he's coming on, he's doing everything too slow. right hand drifting there as he tried to reach Williams. Williams able to get away. Fast feet as well as fast hands for the lanky 25-year-old rising star. Well, you know, Margarito's in trouble when the fans start chanting Mexico, Mexico, trying to urge him on. They stand and trade. Neither one seems capable of hurting the other with one punch. So we're getting these vicious exchanges. Margarito had a momentary chance to land his big left hook and missed it, swinging just over Williams' head. Williams goes back to rocking Margarito with his jab and popping with left hand. Margarito's 
stopping Williams in his track with a hard body shot. Great, great. Good round for Margarita, but still, I don't know if he can maintain this pace. But if he could continue this pace here, he stands a chance. But the biggest thing is, Williams has great stamina himself, which is unusual for a tall fighter like that. Williams trudges back to his corner. Work up. You got five more rounds. Four more rounds. You got me? And you hurl tight. You got me? You want it, don't you? This is it for you, brother. But look, this is what I want you to do. You got to close the gate, you're still backing up. Every time you send a fate, you sell it. Um, he goes. Man. You got to stop the hole. That's right. I'm getting you to go for eight rounds now and giving you a hard warning. No more. I didn't see no hole. Huh? Hey, look, Paul. When you block his punches, throw to the body. Up, up and top. The top and the bottom. Come on, just the way you're doing. Keep them one, one, two, three. He's gonna fall. He's he's not showing too much. When, when he goes down, hit him. You saw copy box numbers, which showed you that Margarito is gradually closing the gap in landed power punches. In the seventh round, Williams landed 28 out of 99. Margarito 23 out of 63. But more of Williams' connects were jabs, and Margarito landed enough power shots that for the first time in the fight, Harold Letterman gives Margarito a round. Eighth round begins. There's a small mouse emerging under the right eye of Paul Williams. Margarito trying to rip Williams' body up with every body shot. Hard right hand by Paul Williams inside. Emmanuel Stewart referee Lou Moret warned Paul Williams to stop holding. I don't think he's been holding all that much. Long-armed fighters often get warned for this. Don't hold. Yeah, you know, it, 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 actually the crowd and the momentum, everything really favors Margarita in this particular fight for the most part. If, if Margarita could just maintain some power and a little speed, he could still pull this fight out. But he's got to pick up his pace, though. It's hard to do with a guy like Williams, because Williams is just out of work. Sure. That's the biggest thing. He's not a big puncher, but he's punching and twisted and contorting his body and punching from all angles. And even if you have a good spot, he's going to come right back again. Roundhouse right for Margarito momentarily drives Williams back. Margarito seems to have solves the rhythm of Williams to a degree because he's blocking a lot of his punches. And he, he landed, landed a, a tremendous right, right hand right there on Williams. Yep, that was a big right hand, Emmanuel. And there's another and big Williams. right hand. And Williams is fighting a lot closer now. He's fighting very, very close where he's within the range for Margarita. If Margarita could just pick up the speed of his punches, he could catch him because Williams is not using his, reaching his distance that much anymore. Williams clearly is the sharper puncher, but opponents of Margarito have said he has a thudding impact. He hurts you with every punch. And there's Margarito across the top again with the right hand. Margarito might prefer to be doing his damage with the left hook, but in this fight, he's gonna have to score with the right, and increasingly he does so. has seen more at pains to find room in the ring in the eighth round than at any other time in the fight. Good hard body shot by Margarito. That left hook to the body punctuated the round. Look, you got to get the mangles. You got to, Paul, and you got to give him a jab. Look, you're standing in, in, in front of him too long. Now he's beginning to realize that he can hit you because you're standing in front. Look, this is the time when the next, next few rounds, Paul, listen at me. You got me? Now, look, you, you got this thing. Keep throwing the finger punch, the uppercut. 
Yeah. Try to faint them in the bottom and go on the top. Come on. Yeah, relax a little bit, okay? Yeah. yeah. Right. Work in the bottom and throw the right hand. Our interpreter tonight in Antonio Margarito's corner is Ray Torres. Emmanuel? Here you see Margarito get close, man. Right hand, left hook. And as long as he can continue the crowd, Paul, and punch with shorter punches, he can land them. But the fact is, I don't think he can sustain it long enough. Combi box numbers in the eighth round. Margarito, 21 of 58. Williams, 30 out of 104. More and more, it becomes a battle between Williams' high volume, the number of punches he's throwing and landing, and the question of whether Margarito can reverse all that with impact, with power. Maybe this is what... Margarita was smiling about in the early rounds, knowing that the speed differential would close as the fight went on. Big left uppercut by Antonio Margarita. Andy lands a straight right hand as Williams let his hands go again. Four punch combination by Paul Williams. Jab, jab, jab. Coming back, trying to stay active, trying to live up to his trainer's command. And you heard trainer George Peterson between rounds, Emmanuel, saying to Williams, he knows that you're gonna stand in front of him and he's got a chance to hit you. But Williams seems to want to fight. But Williams is fighting at the distance and where he can land punches more effective now than Margarita. And Margarita is really having a problem trying to get inside of the fight now. He's just, well, well, he's just shut out. Williams is doing well fighting flat-footed. this fight is completed we will go back to Atlantic City for the interview we secured with Arturo Gatti after Gatti left the ring following his knockout loss to Alfonso Gomez it's a retirement announcement interview which we will bring you following the fight Punches landed and very little sign of it on either fighter's face. Well, I, I think Margarita is, is normally a puncher, but his punches are just so slow tonight and he's walking and getting all off balance, so he's really not getting maximum power in his punches. And Williams, even though he has a great knockout record, I've never considered him a knockout puncher. He just gradually wears guys down because he doesn't have his gloves as tight at the end of the punches. But he's a guy that gets his knockouts back through accumulation of, of punches. Incidentally, they're fighting here tonight with eight ounce gloves. If this fight had taken place in Las Vegas, they'd be wearing 10 ounce gloves. A lot of people were thinking that perhaps one or the other fighter could get knocked out tonight because of these smaller gloves. A big round, I thought, for Williams. It showed what this kid is made of to come back on Margarito that way after the previous you few rounds. You can do it. You got to give him more power. Listen to me. The two rounds to become the champion of the world, okay? You got to give him more angles. He cannot deal with them angles and send more feints. Every time you sell the faint, Paul, he takes it, okay? All you need to do is You seem to be a bounce. He, he's going to come and at you now, boxing. But you got to be aggressive. Come on, hard. Throw in there. Here you see Paul land a right hook. And in fact, that's probably, I think, been his most effective punch tonight, aside from the left uppercut. Because Margarita doesn't even see the punches coming. And Margarita's punches are just too wide. And even at close quarters, Williams is out punching him because his punches are a little shorter. Nine rounds in the books. We go to the 10th. Harold, how do you have it so far? <laughs> okay, Jim. 
Seven rounds to two. 88, 83, Paul Williams. Jim, I, I think Antonio Margarito either needs a knockdown or a knockout to win this fight because there's only three rounds to go, and I got Paul Williams five points up. Williams, just like Larry Merchant said, in round nine, kept the fight at really the proper distance. Margarito couldn't get inside. Williams peppered him with straight right hands, with right jabs, with that straight left hand, with uppercuts. He won the ninth round handily. He takes a seven rounds to two lead. Paul Williams with a five-point lead. I have it six rounds to three which means that Margarito conceivably could get a draw and retain his title if he won the rest of the rounds. Round 10 so far, more of the same. Nothing in the first minute of the 10th round to suggest to you that the kid from Aiken, South Carolina, is in any danger of slowing down against Tijuana's Antonio Margarito. in the center of the ring and just keep fighting. Margarito seems to be slowing down again after three rounds in which he was clearly trying to step up the pace and flurry to the body in particular to try to bring some damage to Williams. Forget, forget the styles, Jim. Let's just enjoy the mayhem. His style now seems to be out of the gym. Let him go, Carl. Let him go. Let him go. Williams, if he wins the fight, is going to have a lot to talk about. Once again, you Let can't go, help Carl. but focus on the notion of guys who turned Margarito down, big name fighters who didn't want to fight him. He got a reputation, particularly on boxing websites, as the most avoided man in the sport. Paul Williams spent two years saying, I'm going to become his mandatory. I want to fight him. And tonight he's trying to make the most of that chance. And remember, as we've noted before, Margarito already has a deal to fight Cotto if he wins. Wipe his face. Okay. You got two rounds. Okay. You got two rounds, Paul. Okay, okay Paul. You stand in it. You got to throw that right hand. You bob and weave and don't throw that right hand. The over right hand. And when you land that right hand, come back with the left hook. He, he goes over the one way. Hit him there. <laughs> Here you see Margarita and get in close, land a good right hand, and there's, this is, in fact, that's been his most effective punch that he's landed has been those short right hands. And you notice he always is effective when he gets in very close, and Williams is not that coordinated, and he lands his little short punches, but he's just not doing enough of it. Tommy Box numbers in round 10, power punches. Margarita opening up, 17 out of 76. Williams, 14 out of 61. Williams has never been in these championship rounds before. It would be a pretty good idea being here in California, Margarita country, for Williams to win one of these two last two rounds if he wants to get the decision. The judges are from California, Ohio, and California. The crowd is trying to cheer Williams into contention in the fight. Or excuse me, cheer Margarito into contention in the fight. Although certainly Williams has made some fans here tonight with his non-stop style. Emmanuel, do you see and 
Antonio Margarito gaining any ground in his quest here? Yes, he's landed more clean punches the last two rounds than he's landed in, in the entire fight for the as I can see. Hard right hand by Margarito. A lot of short right there, little short punches. He's getting closer and landing right hands continually now. Big left hand uppercut by Margarito. Williams keeps throwing. Margarito thinks he's done some damage. But that's that that lies the problem for Margarita. Even though he's landing, he cannot take a break because once he slows down, Williams will continue to go right back to pumping and winning points again. Margarito has Williams in the deep water that fighters talk about where he's never been before. Blood is from a big above cut. the left eye of it. Paul Williams. Williams is bleeding over his left eye. Margarito is strafing him with power shots inside. Big right hand. Antonio Margarito, another right hand on the cut. Paul Williams fading ever so slightly here in the 11th. Margarito with another straight right hand shot. This has been a huge round for Antonio Margarito now, who desperately needed it. Remember, Jim, in the interview, when Margarito said he would have to win this fight with his will, and that's what he's trying to do right this minute. But what has happened right there, as soon as he slowed down, Paul Williams is consistently still. He, even though he got hit a lot, Paul is still right back, taking control again. And that's what's giving him the advantage in consistency. Fascinating. Though put on the defensive by Margarito, Williams' response isn't to go on the defensive at all, but rather to throw as many jabs as he can to seize the initiative back. Deep breath, Paul. Paul, this is the last round. Wake up. This is the last round, brother. Okay? Listen, you still can do what you want to do with this guy. Okay? But listen, you stand in the pocket too long. And he's going to come out here, Paul, and try to stop you. You get me? Okay, now you got it. That was your round. That's the way we're going to do it. We got to do the same thing. Attack him. Be first. Block his puncher and counter punch him. Block and counter punch. That's the way we're gonna do. That's the way we're gonna win. Standing ovation in Carson, California for two fighters who have fought 11 furious rounds. They go to the 12th. If Paul Williams can get off 69 punches in this round, he will have averaged 100 punches per round in the fight. Is it possible to do that and lose? Margarita will hope to make the point. You heard the instructions from the round, from the corner, which Margarito has been doing for the last rounds. Block and counterpunch. Block and counterpunch. But Williams seems highly energized here. Did Margarito punch himself out in the last few rounds? Emmanuel Stewart, there's a huge cut over the left eye of Paul Williams, but it doesn't seem to bother him for the moment. No, nothing is going to bother him. He's, he's, he's determined to win this fight, and, and he's been fighting consistently for the whole 12 rounds, almost every minute of each round he's been fighting. Even when he would lose in spots, he still continued to fight, and that's what's making it so difficult for Margarita to win because Margarita only can fight in spots. For Williams right now. He's really made Margarita look like a very ordinary fighter. If Margarita loses, his date with Miguel Cotto goes down the drain. And now you see the outline of the problem Cotto may be facing toward 
continued progress in the welterweight division. What if at some point he had to face a showdown with a guy who's six feet one? And busy all the time, and punching him, twisting him, turning him, all the time punching. I, Jim, if Williams wins this fight, the, the odds are that Mosley will fight Cotto. That's right. There's no immediate prospect of a fight between Cotto and Williams. It's just that when you consider Cotto's progress well down the road, at some point it could be the logical step. But now 20 seconds to go here, and Antonio Margarito has not been able to get Paul Williams to wear give, down. Give the kid his props. He's come back after two hard rounds and has won this last round. And that, presumably, but not positively, should cement a title victory. He put a ribbon on it with a big right hook at the end. Both fighters hold their arms up. But one does so way more convincingly. What a performance by young Paul Williams. His debut at the top level of the division, he took on a guy whom a lot of people had seemed to avoid. He met him head on in the center of the ring and fought him for 12 full rounds. And the way both of these fighters fought, Jim, it's the type of fight that afterwards you say, I want to see the winner in a big fight, but I want to see the loser as well. One judge, David Mendoza from California, not a ton of title fight experience. No notable fights for us to report to you. Tom Miller of Ohio, 21 title fights. One of those who scored Sergei Lyakovich, the winner over Lehman Brewster in Lyakovich's decision victory last year. Marty Salmon of California, only three title fights, or title fights, and again, no notable fights for us to report to you. Paul Williams threw 125 punches in the 12th round, his high number for the fight. Harold, how did you score it? Okay, Jim, 116, 112, eight rounds to four, Paul Williams. I agree with Larry. Paul did a terrific job in round 12. I mean, you know, you figure the kid would have been tired because he got hammered in rounds 10 and 11, but boy, he kept Antonio Margarito at the proper distance, threw a zillion punches, just outworked him. That was the, the story of the fight. He really deser deserves this fight. I mean, he boxed beautifully. 116, 112, eight rounds to four, Paul Williams. There's the cut over the left eye of Williams. Non-essential at this point. And now Jimmy Lennon already has the scores. Let's find out who won the fight with Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, after 12 rounds of action, the judges are in agreement. We have a unanimous decision. Here are the score totals. Judge at ringside, Tom Miller sees the bout 116 to 112. Judges David Mendoza and Marty Salmon both score the bout 115 to 113. All three in favor of the winner. And the new WBO welterweight champion of the world, Paul the Punisher Williams. Paul Williams threw 1,256 punches in 12 rounds against one of the roughest, toughest welterweights alive. And for that, he has a title belt and his biggest victory so far among 33 consecutive wins. Raised in Aiken, South Carolina, trained in Aiken, South Carolina, now lives across the river in Augusta, Georgia, Williams has a giant victory. And for Antonio Margarito, after years of recovering from losses early in his career, when he was not managed or promoted as a top fighter, the long drive toward the top is momentarily halted by Williams' victory. CompuBox numbers are spectacular. Williams landing 78 more punches, or make it 88 more punches, and throwing nearly 500 or actually more than 500 more punches 512 more punches nearly doubling the punch output actually that graphic does not conform to the final numbers 
I have final numbers that show Williams throwing 1,256 punches in the fight and averaging more than 100 punches per round, and I believe those numbers are correct because they come from the computer right in front of me. Now let's go to Larry Merchant standing by with the winner, Paul Williams. Thank you very much, Jim. Congratulations, Paul. You seem to have him at bay for the first half of the fight, winning easily. How hard was the second half? You know, the second half was real hard, you know. I knew Margarita was going to come on the second half. So, you know, people hit me with a lot of shots and stuff, you know, but, you know, you got to have a, a, a heart of a war. You got to keep on pushing it through. Even though he hit me with the cut, I got the cut, you know, so I feel the blood coming to my eye and stuff. But, you know, he can't let none of that bother, you know, I come to war. And I know he, he came to bring it, but, you know, I, I got to take my head off. I had to take it from the jump, you know. I put the rounds in early, you know. Did he ever hurt you, particularly late in the fight when he was reaching you more? Well, I got to say again, I got stung again. <laughs> you know, he moved some nice, good shots, but, man, the training that we did in Puerto Rico, you know, it, it prepared me to you know, take these shots and stuff. And, you know, I had to keep coming out. I know, that I know it was getting close to 11 and stuff. I know the 12th, I had to come out. I had to use that jab a little more than I wanted to. I had to you, know? you seem to get a little bit fatigued late in the fight, 9th, 10th, 11th rounds. Did you know you had to suck it up to win the last round? Oh, yes, sir. You know, Mr. Peterson told me, you know what I'm saying? If you want it, you got to get it, you know. He I had to pick it up in the late rounds, you know, even though because... I didn't really get in my rhythm like I wanted to. You know, we didn't have time to warm up like we normally do. But, you know, no excuses. I had to come by and do what I got to do. Who are you going to call out tonight? Well, I want Cotto. If I can't get Cotto, I want to get a shot at Mayweather. Thank you. Congratulations, Paul. You, now, Jim, we'll talk to the, I guess, old WBO title holder. Uh, Antonio, you were smiling through the early rounds as though you knew that you or thought you would catch him in the later rounds. Did you think you did enough to win? Pues es que realmente me reía porque los golpes bloqueaban en mis manos, o sea, nunca nunca entró ni un golpe limpio. I, I was smiling because I wasn't getting hit. I was blocking all the punches, and that's why I was smiling. He was outworking you, winning by simply throwing more punches early in the fight. Did you know that you might have to stop him in the second half of the fight? Él, él actualmente tiró más golpes que tú, te está, estaba trabajando más que tú. ¿Sabías tú que necesitabas que no, eh, un nocao para ganar en lo último? No, no, para nada. A lo mejor quizás tiró más golpes que yo, pero yo conecté mal. Los, los de él nunca llegaron y, y estuve, estuve trabajando. Yo sabía que iba arriba en las tarjetas, pero no sé qué pasó. Fue un robo eso. Yeah. I, he, he, he threw more punches than I, but I threw, landed the harder punches. I think it was a robbery. When you went back to your corner at the end of the fight, did you think you had won the fight? Cuando se terminó la pelea fuiste tú esquina, ¿sabías tú que había ganado la pelea? Sí, claro. Desde que iba como el noveno al santo, yo sabía que iba adelante en las tarjetas. Yo creo que gané los los últimos rounds también y y fue un robo la pelea. Realmente no estoy a gusto. Yeah, absolutely. I thought I won, won the fight. Going back to, after the ninth round, I knew I was ahead on the cards. I won the last couple of rounds. I still think it was a robbery. Thank you very much, Antonio, for Hola. a good fight. No es cierto, Cobrita. Tú no estás viendo, tú sabes que ganamos las peleas. Un saludo para Tijuana y todos saben que ganamos las peleas. Uh, uh, say, say hello to Tijuana and Cobrita. Everybody knows I won this fight. Síguete recuperando, Burguitos. Thank you. Jim? Fascinatingly, the fight was on the table going to the 12th round. Both California judges uh, scored the 12th round for Williams to give him his victory margin, 115-113. If Antonio Margarito could have won the 12th round on the two California judges' scorecards, you would have had a majority draw in the fight. Quickly, let's take a look at the welterweight graphic with which we began the evening looking at six prominent names in the welterweight division. And Mayweather and Cotto now get to share the top rung by themselves. Mosley, Paul Williams, and Kermit Cintron along the bottom row. Antonio Margarito's name removed from that top welterweight graphic as of this moment. Right now, we're going to take you back to Atlantic City, New Jersey, 
But before we go to Atlantic City, a quick comment from Larry Merchant about Williams's win over Margarito and their comments in the ring. Jim, I th understandably, Margarito felt he had won the fight. Um, that's his kind of fight. We've seen him in a lot of tough, hard fights like that. But I thought Paul Williams won the fight, and I think any fair-minded person would as well. But I want to add something here tonight. We've talked a lot about the welterweight picture, how all the fights are coming out of that welterweight division. Well, here's, here's a news break, as we used to say in the old print business. The indications are very strong that Oscar De La Hoya is going to follow his former dance partner and now business partner, Shane Mosley, back to the welterweight division. He is walking around now, I'm told, in the low 150-pound range. He thinks that this is where he should close his career, and that mixes all of the projections up and changes everything. Because if you recall, everybody saying that his fight with Mayweather was a bit of a disappointment because of all of the hype and the buildup and the expectations, it generated so much money, close to $150 million, that you know that the people in boxing want to see more of De La Hoya and more big fights and we are going to see De La Hoya most probably in the welterweight division in the future. Indeed, and of course, once again, although Mayweather and De La Hoya took place at 154 pounds, Floyd Mayweather's far more natural weight is 147, and all expectations are that if he campaigns in the future, that's also in the welterweight division. And that's one of the reasons why we had a great welterweight triple header tonight, beginning with two fights in Atlantic City before we came here to Carson, California. For more on what happened in Atlantic City, let's go back to Bob Papa. All right, Jim, the boardwalk is teeming with Arturo Gatti fans, but a night of disappointment here at Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey, as Arturo Gatti in his fight against Alfonso Gomez comes up short, a fight in which he was dominated really from the start until the very end. And throughout the course of this fight, Alfonso Gomez took the action to Arturo Gatti and really just imposed his will on Gatti from the opening bell. Early in the fight, it was blistering right hands throughout the course of the action that just found the mark time and time again. Gomez was able to use his left hand, work his jab solidly, and in the end, Arturo Gatti had no answers in this fight. Alfonso Gomez stepped up the pressure in round number seven, and this right hand right there put Arturo Gatti down, and the fight was stopped in the seventh round. The illustrious career of 35-year-old Arturo Gatti coming to a close at the hands of Alfonso Gomez. The contender steps up against Arturo Gatti, and his career with so many great wars here in Atlantic City comes to an end. He announced his retirement. Afterwards, back in the locker room area, Max Kellerman had a chance to catch up with Thunder Gatti about his retirement. Arturo, uh, a guy who's uh, fought with all kinds of stuff broken on him and continued to throw punches, and now looks like your lips cut up pretty good there, and you're talking to us, so thank you. Um, what happened tonight? Uh, it was just stronger than I was. Uh, he's a hungry fighter, young fighter, strong. You know, I did my best. Uh, I came in thinking that I can outbox him, but, uh, you know, the ring was getting smaller and smaller with a bigger man. And uh, it just sucks that from 40 to 47, it's just a different me. Uh, I wish I could make 140, but it's impossible. So I, I don't see myself continuing at 147. I'm going to retire, and I can't be taking this abuse no more. Did you feel, you said, for the Baldemir fight? You felt like you shouldn't have been there that day. Did you feel prepared and like you should be in the ring today? Oh, yes, I was well prepared. You know, I'm just I'm sad for my team because we worked so hard, and uh, I just did my best. I felt great. You know, I was in good shape, but uh, I wasn't strong enough for uh, Gomez. And it's just seen, it just shows that I, I don't belong at 147. You don't belong at 147 and can't make 140, and therefore you're a man without a weight division. No, so that means... Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> Arturo, 
Is there anything you'd like to say to your many fans who I'm sure at this moment, if this is indeed the end of your career, feel very grateful for all the memories? Is there anything you'd like to tell them? I just want to say that I love you guys. I really tried hard tonight, and uh, you know how, hard, how big my heart is that I just couldn't do it, and I give my best. And I love you guys for supporting me for tough, and, and, uh, for tough times for me, and uh, you guys brought, my, brought me back and made me win the second world title. I love you guys, and thank you very much, and uh, I had a great time doing it. And again, so much heart, even talking as the lip is opening up and bleeding. Arturo, thanks for the memories. Thanks a lot, Max. A fond farewell from all of us at HBO Sports to Arturo Gatti, whose trilogy with Mickey Ward, his trainer tonight, meant so much to the most recent years of our boxing telecast, who was one of the most exciting fighters ever to appear on our network and who proved more than any other fighter the paradigm that it doesn't matter so much whether you win or lose, it's more about how you fight. That's what builds your relationship to the public. That's what built the Arturo Gatti love affair, which sustained him through so much of his career. Well, a brilliant night in the welterweight division, a great performance by Kermit Cintron, a terrific performance by Alfonso Gomez in saying farewell to Arturo Gatti, and most significantly, a big victory for Paul Williams here in Carson, California, who stays undefeated, lifts a title belt from the previously much-feared Antonio Margarito and makes his mark as a new rising American star, potentially a super superstar in boxing, Paul Williams of Aiken, South Carolina. We're glad you were able to be with us for this, and we continue all of our boxing and sports activity in the future July 17. Catch the next installment of Real Sports. Among the stories, we sit down with the always outspoken Gary Sheffield, who has created a firestorm with his criticism of Joe Torre and the New York Yankees. July 24, it's a special edition of Costas Now. Halfway through the baseball season, Kurt Schilling, Bud Sealing, Ozzie Smith, and Chris Rock join Bob for a midsummer review of the game. Next on HBO, stay tuned for the premiere of Countdown to Hopkins Wright, a half hour documentary style look at Bernard Hopkins and Winky Wright as they prepare for their July 21 matchup on HBO pay per view. And now for our entire HBO crew, I'm Jim Lampley saying so long from Carson, California. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports. The lights come up on two veteran warriors, this time on Boxing After Dark. In the main event, Atlanta's Vernon Forrest goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Argentina's Carlos Baldemir. With relentless fury and persistence, Baldemir, the former welterweight champ, is hungry to avenge his first loss in eight years to Floyd Mayweather. But having been to the top of the welterweight division himself, Forrest now battles his way back in hopes of another shot at the crown. Emotions ignite as former champions collide. Boxing After Dark, Forrest versus Baldemir. Live Saturday, July 28th. Next on HBO. Get ready for the light heavyweight championship showdown. HBO Sports presents Countdown to Hopkins Wright. Next on HBO. A special edition of Costas Now premieres Tuesday, July 24th. The critics have spoken. HBO is the funniest hour of comedy on television with Entourage and Flight of the Concords. I love it. The Washington Post calls Entourage fabulous. That was a short sure thing. And Daily Variety says it's downright hilarious. That does make me feel good. The San Francisco Chronicle says Flight of the Concords is pitch perfect funny. Pretty impressive, huh? And the New York Times calls it a lot of fun. Glad you like it. Every Sunday, starting with Entourage at 10, followed by Flight of the Concords at 10.30. Don't miss the best hour of comedy every Sunday night. That is amazing. Stay tuned for the exclusive world premiere of the trailer for Medellin tomorrow after Entourage. 
on the next Real Sports. In his 20-year career, Gary Sheffield has attracted more than his fair share of attention. So what teams have you been on where you've not seen white and black players treated equally? Yankees. Unafraid to be heard, the nine-time All-Star Say Anything Attitude has placed him in the center of baseball's most controversial issues. If you asked me what I did, I just told you what I did. Now, am I a steroid user? I don't consider that as being a steroid user. Steroids, race, and the state of the game. Real Sports sits down with the Detroit Tigers' Gary Sheffield. The Emmy Award winning Real Sports with Brian Gumbel premieres Tuesday night at 10. Nothing is out of bounds.